Hi, I'm Tony Alisea, and welcome to the first three and a half hours of my course, Understanding HTML and CSS. Note that this video is only a portion of the full course, which you can find a link to in the description of the video. In this YouTube video, we'll cover a lot of HTML content. We'll cover tree data structures that underpin the understanding of HTML and CSS. We'll look at authoring semantic HTML. We'll gain an understanding of reading the HTML specification and an understanding of the document object model, or DOM. In the full course, you'll get more HTML content as well as all of the CSS content. In the CSS portion of the course, we'll cover things like the cascade, inheritance, and specificity. You'll understand how to read the CSS specifications. We'll learn about the box model and box position. You'll gain an understanding of the browser rendering engine and a proper understanding of flow and the writing mode, Flexbox, Grid, and a lot more. Whether you decide to get the full course or not, this video will help you build skill as an HTML author and reset your mental model, even if you are an experienced web developer. All right, enjoy the video. They're two of the foundational technologies of the modern internet. And they're a fundamental skill for anyone touching web development. HTML, a language to go beyond text and provide meaning and intent. CSS, a language to express a document visually. Welcome to your journey into properly understanding these two technologies. Welcome to understanding HTML and CSS. In this course, we'll remove the confusion, intimidation, and bad habits that many even experienced web developers still have. You'll gain skill and confidence in using these two technologies that allow many to take care of themselves and their families in real world jobs, even from home. So let's begin. I'm Tony Alisea, and this is Understanding HTML and CSS. Hi, welcome to the course. In this course, you'll learn to become an HTML author. What that really means is a big focus of this course. You'll also learn to lay out web pages visually using cascading style sheets, or CSS. Along the way, we'll gain an understanding of a fundamental concept that both HTML and CSS rely on, called trees, and not the green kind, but the computer science kind. We'll also gain an understanding of browser rendering engines and how they work to create the web pages that you'll be writing. You'll become comfortable and confident in reading the HTML and CSS specifications, the same documents that people who make browsers read, and will enable you to teach yourself in the future. Finally, overall, you'll become skilled in HTML and CSS. For beginners, nothing is assumed about your knowledge. For experienced developers, the course is structured to reset your mental model and help you break bad habits that many developers fall into. This entire course is designed around a core philosophy. Don't imitate, understand. There are a lot of learning materials out there where you just follow along, imitating what someone else does on screen. And you can learn some things that way. But the moment you're faced with a real world situation in a project or job, that's different from what you've imitated, or the moment a problem comes up that you need to solve, you may find yourself struggling. That's because to truly become skilled, you need to truly, deeply understand. And that's my goal for you in this course and all my courses. So thanks for being a student. And let's begin this journey together to understanding HTML and CSS. First, let's make sure we're set up properly so we have the tools we need for this course. The program we'll be using throughout this course is called Visual Studio Code. You can Google that, or you can go to code.visualstudio.com. It's a free text editor provided by Microsoft, but it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Once you have downloaded it and installed it, then you'll open Visual Studio Code, and you'll need to go to Extensions and then search for an extension called Live Server. 
The live server extension, once installed, will turn our computer into a kind of mini internet so that we can create HTML and CSS files and then deliver them to that same computer's browser as if it was retrieving them from the internet. Once you have that, you're ready to start the course. In this, the first section of this course, we'll establish an essential foundation upon which to build a proper understanding of HTML and CSS. Let's talk about trees. To begin, it's time for our first conceptual aside. In this course, whenever you see this symbol, it means we're about to focus on a topic that isn't directly the topic of the course, but rather a vital piece of side knowledge that you need to properly learn HTML and CSS. Asides are about illuminating how things really work. In this first conceptual aside, let's talk about data structures. Big word alert. Throughout this course, whenever you see a big word alert, that means we're introducing a technical term. These terms usually sound much more complex than they really are. So we'll point them out and clarify their meaning to ensure terminology doesn't get in the way of learning. So, big word alert. Data structure. A particular way to organize and store data so that a computer can quickly and efficiently access and modify it. Let's look at an example. A computer's memory is full of data. That data sits in particular memory locations that have addresses to identify them. The data can then be accessed via that address. And a memory location can contain a reference to the address of a different memory location, pointing from one to the other. We can think of a data structure then as deciding what different memory locations will contain. That is, whether they will contain data or point to other memory locations. For example, here I may decide that I have groups of three memory locations where the first contains data and the next two either point to another memory location or are empty. If I was to imagine this visually, I might draw it like a series of boxes and arrows. Each box represents the location where the data is stored. Each memory location that points to another memory location is represented by an arrow. In this way, I can have boxes that point to other boxes back and forth. There's a name for structuring data this way. It's called a doubly linked list and it's a type of data structure. Data structures not only keep data organized, but importantly, they allow a computer to access its memory in a structured way. For example, a computer could travel, so to speak, along the linked list by following the memory location pointers. And there are many kinds of data structures, each different and useful for different purposes. For example, there are linked lists, arrays, and trees. For this course, there is one data structure in particular that is of interest to us. It will appear again and again and again. It's perfect for storing the kind of information that we need when it comes to HTML and CSS. That data structure is called a tree. Understanding this data structure and knowing how to talk about it is a necessary skill when dealing with HTML and CSS. So let's take a deeper look. To talk about HTML and CSS, we need to be able to talk about tree data structures. First of all, the computer science idea of a tree is usually represented as an upside down tree with the root at the top and the branches and leaves below. If you look at a typical drawn representation of data in a tree structure, you realize it really does look like an upside down tree, especially when you add lots of branches. The vocabulary used when talking about trees, however, also borrows from a different tree metaphor, 
that of a family tree. By a family tree, meaning a structured upside down tree of descendants from some starting point back in time. There are more generic terms for family trees that are borrowed when talking about tree data structures. If we focus on the highlighted person, then these are that person's siblings, their children, and the rest of their descendants, their parent, and their ancestors. And eventually you get to the root, which is the bottom of the tree. Remember the tree is upside down. We use these exact same terms when talking about tree data structures. So a particular item in the tree has siblings, children, a parent, ancestors, a root, etc. A particular item in the tree is called a node. So a node of the tree has siblings, a node has children, a node has a parent, and so on. All of these terms are terms we will see again, and they're fairly self-explanatory. Just keep them in mind. You're already speaking like a computer scientist. You're speaking the language of trees. As we saw, data structures are really just ways of organizing data in a computer's memory. So when we say a tree, we of course aren't talking about the real thing, but a data structure implementation that's influenced by real world trees. Oh, wait a minute. Big word alert. Implementation, the process of putting a plan into effect. It's important to keep in mind that how tree data structures are implemented will impact how we deal with our HTML and CSS, especially when it comes to writing things that are efficient. We'll see that more later. So how are trees implemented? Well, they're different from doubly linked lists that we saw before. A single piece of data can have many points to other pieces of data, like branches. What you see here, of course, is extremely overly simplified, but hopefully you get the idea. Now, what are the advantages of this data structure? Well, for starters, you can think of the data in B and C as related in some way to the data in A. Then B may have its own related data and so on. With that in mind, we can imagine what a computer might be able to accomplish with this data structure. That's next. One of the primary benefits of a tree data structure is that there are many efficient ways to search for a particular piece of data by traversing the tree. Big word alert. Traverse, to travel across or through. So to traverse a tree simply means to move around from block of data to block of data. Let's suppose we're instructing a computer to find out if this tree contains the letter C. It might start at the first memory location, the root of the tree. Check and nothing there. And then traverse the tree by following the pointers and visiting different memory locations until it locates what we're searching for. If we imagine a larger tree, we could imagine different approaches for traversing the tree. For example, we might instruct the computer to travel down a tree until it reaches the bottom of the tree and then work its way sideways and back up until it finds what we're looking for. If it finds what we're looking for, then the search was successful. Otherwise, perhaps we'd say not found. The idea of storing data in a tree data structure and traversing that tree is step one of understanding HTML and CSS in a deep way. All right, now that we have this clear in mind, it's time to dive into our first major subject. HTML. 
In this section, we'll introduce you to HTML. Perhaps this is entirely new for you, in which case, welcome to this exciting field. Or perhaps you've worked with HTML for years. If you're experienced, I encourage you to set aside what you know and come into the topic with fresh eyes. There are a lot of bad habits that experienced folks can build up when it comes to HTML, and starting carefully from scratch, resetting your mental models will be the key to improving your skill and the quality of your development life. So, here we go. Let's talk about hypertext markup language. In this section, in particular, we'll discuss the M and L in HTML. But don't worry, the H and the T come just a bit later. The first thing to understand is that when we talk about HTML, we're talking about documents. More specifically, text documents. That's why we're using Visual Studio Code, which is a text editor, and not something like Microsoft Word, which is a word processor. An HTML document is just a text document. So let's introduce the text document we'll be working on together for the rest of this course. I've opened a folder in Visual Studio Code. I've done that by going to File and Open Folder. So I encourage you to do that for the rest of this course. Make a folder for your files, open it in Visual Studio Code, and that's where we'll work. Now I'm going to make a new file. I'll right-click New File, and we'll start with just a text document, resume.txt. I've increased the font size quite a bit by going to File, Preferences, and Settings, and that's just so that you can see the content more easily here in the video. I've already prepared ahead of time the text document we'll work on. So I'll just drop it in here and let's take a look. It's my resume. There's my header, my name with some contact information, a little blurb from me, a list of the services I offer, my skills, my work history. A lot of this is fake. And then I've got a spot for a portfolio. Maybe I'm thinking some pictures of some of my work some testimonials from students. And if someone really wants to, they can snail mail me directly to an address. This is a document, a text document. It's my resume and it means something to me. And if you read it, you could probably figure out what I'm talking about. This is where we'll begin. There's no HTML in this text document yet, but it's a starting point. So I encourage you to also create your starting point. You can use mine, or update it to match your own. And we'll use this as a project throughout the entire rest of this course. All right, so here we have our document and we're ready to move on. It's time for another conceptual aside. User agents. Big word alert. An agent something that acts on someone else's behalf. For example, an actor might have an agent that goes and looks for work for them. They act on their behalf. So a user agent is software that acts on the user's behalf. You ask user agents to do things for you probably every day. You're using one now. The user wants information stored out on computers on the internet. The most common thing a user requests is text documents, more specifically, HTML documents. The user agent sits between the user and that information, facilitating making the request and delivering the response. And here's where we begin to break bad habits. You might think of a user agent as providing you something visual, like a web page that you see. But really, a user agent may deliver that information, that document, in any number of ways. And there are various types of user agents. Browsers may deliver information visually. Screen readers are user agents that deliver the information via spoken word. Googlebot is another user agent. 
It reads information on the internet with the purpose of categorizing it and making it available in Google search engine. Now, in this course, we're talking about creating those documents that will be requested by users. So we have an essential job. We want to help user agents do their job successfully. Our job is to help user agents deliver the contents of our document in the most understandable, accurate way possible. So a user, all users, can benefit from it. To learn this job, to break bad habits, I'm going to ask something of you that might surprise you. We're not going to open a web browser for a while. As we write HTML, I'm going to ask you not to look at it in a web browser, just in a text editor. I know, I know, you may be here to make web pages, and we'll do that, but we're going to do it properly. We're going to build good habits, we're going to break bad habits, and we're going to do this by understanding what HTML is, and we'll do that by avoiding a web browser for a little while. But don't worry, we'll spend a lot of time in a web browser soon. One other thing, and this might surprise you as well. There's something I'd like to promise you, if you stick with me in this. In a short amount of time, you will be more skilled in HTML than many web developers. That sounds impossible, especially if you're a beginner, but I'm asking you to trust me. You can be highly skilled. You will be highly skilled. Okay, are you with me? Ready? Let's move on. Let's talk about the M in HTML. Let's talk about markup. We already introduced the idea of a text document, a resume. If the resume was printed, and I wanted to clarify the contents of the document, I might write a note on the document like this. I'm marking up the document, and that's where the idea comes from. Literally the marks that an editor might make on a document to provide instructions or clarifications. But how do we mark up a document in a way that a computer can read? I might do this. It's just more text, but now it's part of the document. There's a problem though. The markup says this is his name, but which part of the document is it? The Tony? The entire Tony Alisea? The computer can't tell. We could do something like this. Now we have markup at the beginning and end of what is being marked up. I can see that I mean the entire name, Tony Alisea. Seems like a lot to write though. This is better, much shorter, faster to write, and the document will be smaller to download, since there will be less characters in it. But we still have a problem. Parentheses are commonly used in normal writing. How does the computer know that this is markup and not just normal text? That's better. We'll use less than and greater than signs instead of parentheses. This is still easy for a human to read and a computer as well. But we still have a problem. How do I know the second name markup isn't the beginning of a different name rather than the end of one? It would be better to say, here's where the name begins and here's where the name ends. So we could adjust the markup so that the ending marker is different, but still obviously connected to the starting marker. And that could be anything. We could do something like this. What we end up doing though, in reality, is this, a forward slash. And now all the problems are cleared up. We're marking up the document. Now these pieces of markup, they have a name. Tags, a start tag and an end tag. A tag then is a way to mark up the document that's friendly to user agents that software that's acting on a user's behalf, and it's easy for us, for humans, to read and write. The markup describes the document. 
And by marking up a document, then, you are attempting to add meaning. This is the idea of markup, markup in general. It's really a simple concept, isn't it? Yet it's driven tremendous progress in the area of information architecture. We'll be writing a lot of markup in the upcoming lectures, marking up our entire resume. So let's move on. Let's talk now about the L in HTML, language. We have another problem to solve. What if different people use different markup to mean the same thing? That would be a consistency problem, both for humans and computers. We need to be speaking the same language. What we need then is a markup language. A markup language does what any language like English or Spanish does. It provides a few important things. A consistent vocabulary. We're all using the same terms. Because of that, we can convey meaning clearly. There's no confusion because we know what that particular piece of markup is trying to convey. A language exists to facilitate communication. So by having a markup language, we're facilitating a particular type of communication so that the user agent can then give to the user the intended meaning of the document. And when we're learning the language, if it's consistent, we can go to a dictionary and look it up. And we'll do that here in this course. There is the equivalent of a dictionary for hypertext markup language. All of this then, the idea of language is about providing consistent meaning. Just like English or Spanish or another language, a markup language provides all of these things. And that's what HTML, hypertext markup language, does. Everyone writing HTML should be using the same markup to mean the same thing. That also means that it's our job to learn and use the language fluently, to use it for its purpose, to communicate meaning. And the idea of meaning is what we'll discuss next. It's time for a conceptual aside. Semantics and authoring. Big word alert. Semantic, having to do with meaning. This is my name in the document, but they're just words. I want to convey the meaning. The tag I choose is intended to convey a particular meaning. In this case, I'm trying to convey that what's between the tags is the name of something. Thus, this markup is semantic. It isn't just there to say, make it yellow or make it big. It has to do with describing the document conceptually. Now, even if I didn't write the name, when I add tags, I'm contributing to the authorship of the document. I'm authoring markup. Big word alert. Author. In this case, a verb. To author. To contribute to writing a document. When we author something, we're adding meaning, which means we're concerned with semantics. We're not just writing the contents, we're also making sure the contents are understood, and that's part of authoring. So when we add tags to a document, we're authoring a document. We're contributing to it, extending it, and helping it to be communicated accurately. So from now on, we'll refer to authoring HTML and to you as an HTML author. Let's dig more into the building blocks of markup, tags, attributes, and elements. So again, let's imagine we have a document and we have my name. We're going to mark it up with some tags. This tag is about meaning, but we can then also add other related pieces of information or instructions to a tag. 
Now, I should point out that right now we're just kind of inventing our own markup language. As an example, this isn't HTML yet. First, we're just getting the concepts. Now, let's suppose in this markup language, my markup language, I'm going to add the ability to add some extra information. For example, I want to show that in this case, I mean the first name. Other related pieces of information or instructions are called attributes. This is an attribute, and they're formatted always the same way. The attribute name, then an equal sign, then the value inside quotes. And you can have more than one attribute. You can have many attributes. This is an attribute, and this is an attribute. What I'm saying then is what's between these tags is a name. It's a first name, and it's a nickname. And this is just me deciding how I want that to be marked up in my language. If someone else used my markup language, they should do the same thing. Now, this entire block, the tags with the attributes and its contents, is called an element. And here we have the vocabulary of markup tags, attributes, and elements. So add that in along with the vocabulary of trees. And now we're really getting into the details and speaking like an HTML author. It's time to connect two ideas that we've seen, elements and trees. Here's my name again. Let's suppose with my markup language, I can mark up my name like this, my first name and my last name. Let's make it a bit easier to read. And then we can think of each element. Remember, that's the start and end tags with all attributes and contents. We can think of each as a node in a tree. Let's suppose our two nodes had a parent. Then the markup would look like this. The first name and last name elements are contents inside the name element. The first name and last name elements are nested inside the name element. Big word alert. Nested, placed inside something else. We could write our markup like this. It would still be valid and easy for a computer to read. But markup isn't just designed for computers to read. It's also designed for humans to be able to read and understand it easily. You might come back to markup like this and have a hard time understanding it even if you wrote it, or pass it to someone else who definitely will have a hard time. So we might do something like this. In markup languages, white space doesn't matter much, at least anything beyond a single space. We can split up the name this way, and it doesn't mean there's suddenly a new line between Tony and Alisea, because the markup itself isn't content. We can do even better then. This is very clear, and often how you will see markup written. This is how we will write our markup throughout this course, and I encourage you to do the same. Another benefit is that you can start to see the relationship to tree data structures. We have a root, a name, and two children, first name and last name. Can you see that? Do you see the tree? Well-formatted markup makes those relationships easy to see at just a glance. So now we've seen the idea of markup, and I'd like you to understand that when we talk about markup, we're not just talking about HTML, but markup languages. And markup is everywhere. In the digital world, it's in even surprising places. For example, I've made a new Word document. Let's open it up. It's empty. I'll call it Tony's document and then say, hello world. I'll make Tony's document the title. I'll make hello bold. There's my Word document. Now here's something you may not know. I can take this file, the docx, 
and I can change it to a .zip that is a compressed folder of many files. That's actually what a DOCX file is. A Word document is actually a compressed folder of many files. Now, I can extract all of those, get all those files out into a folder. Now I'll open it, right click, open with code. And here's my Word document. It has different folders, and one of the .xml files, or extensible markup language files, is document.xml. And when I go through here, you start to see tags. In fact, there's Tony's document marked up as a title. I can go down and find hello, and there's a tag that tells it to be bold. And I can find space world in a tag that says to make sure to keep that space and display it to the user. So when Microsoft Word reads this markup language, let's change this back to a .docx, it interprets it like a user agent and displays it to me. Now, you don't need to learn Word ML, Word Markup Language. That's not the point. The point is that markup language is a proven technology, a proven approach to marking up documents. So now we're going to focus not on just any markup language, but on hypertext markup language. First, a conceptual aside. Specifications. Big word alert. A specification is a standard of precise requirements, and internet technologies overall are governed by many specifications. There are organizations in charge of writing and maintaining these specifications, and then all of us who work in these fields benefit by following these specifications. Sometimes we just call it the spec. So there's an HTML specification. There's a CSS specification. In this course, you're going to learn how to read the specs. We're going to dive into them. And what that will do is enable you to teach yourself. By knowing what a specification is and then being able to use it, as technology changes, which it always will as new things are added, you won't always have to come back to courses like this one. You'll be able to read the specification make decisions, and keep yourself up to date. Maybe that means that I won't be selling you a huge sequel to this course, but it does mean that you'll benefit, that you'll progress in your skill as an HTML author. And that's my goal. Let's move on. It's time for our first dive into the HTML specification. Another way of thinking about it it's like it's the dictionary for our markup language, but it's a lot more than that. Let's take a look. If you Google HTML specification, the first link will take you to the official spec. It's html.spec.whatwg.org. It's a living standard, which means that it changes. It changes as new things are added. You'll find that you want to go to the multi-page version, most likely, as that will be the easiest to download. There's a one-page version that's everything on one page. You can use that too. There's also a version for web devs. This is focused just for authors, because the HTML specification is also read by others. Now, this might be something you want to look at later, but for this course, we're going to stay in the complete specification to see everything that we can learn. The specification has a table of contents. The main two areas we'll be dealing with are sections three and sections four. So what can we learn from at the very beginning? Well, here's the first thing I want to show you. Section 1.2, is this HTML5? The first thing it says is, this section is non-normative. Big word alert. 
normative, establishing a standard. So the parts of the specification that really are establishing the standard, that are the rules that must be followed, those are normative. But there's non-normative parts of the specification that are not part of establishing a standard. What they are usually are explanatory. The specification is full of wonderful explanations and examples. They're called non-normative, but that doesn't mean they're not useful. It just means this is not the actual spec. This is us explaining the spec to you. So it asks the question, is this HTML5? The short answer is yes. But in more length, well, let's do this for the first time, something we'll be doing throughout this course. Let's zoom in on the spec. Here's the same phrase we were just looking at. The term HTML5 is widely used as a buzzword to refer to modern web technologies. So what does that mean? Well, you may have noticed that this course is not called Understanding HTML5 and CSS3. It's just Understanding HTML and CSS. That's because HTML5 as the specification itself says, is really just a buzzword. HTML and CSS are living specifications. They're modern technologies that continue to be updated. We're learning HTML and CSS. Now let's use the spec to see what it says about the background of HTML. Again, it's a non-normative section. Let's zoom in on it. It says HTML is the World Wide Web's core markup language. Originally, it was primarily designed as a language for semantically describing scientific documents. This general design has enabled it to be adapted over the subsequent years to describe another of other types of documents and even applications. Notice that from the very beginning, HTML was intended to be semantic. In this case, it was intended to help add meaning to scientific documents and share them among scientists. Now it does a lot more than that. But sometimes people talk about more modern recent HTML and HTML5 as, as if that's when semantics came into play. That's wrong. HTML has always been about semantics. And yeah, a few things got muddled along the way. But that's what it's always been. And that's what it is today. Let's skip audience. We'll talk about that a bit later. And let's look at the scope of this HTML specification. It says, this specification is limited to providing a semantic level markup language. And in general, it's about authoring accessible pages on the web, ranging from static documents to dynamic applications. So. It is what we've been talking about. You're authoring accessible pages. We'll see that word later, along with static and dynamic. But HTML is a semantic language to author documents that are intended to be accessed on the internet. Now, I'd like to throw in a reference to a separate but related specification that we'll see down the line and talk more about. This is from the document object model specification or DOM specification. Don't worry about what that means right now. But what it says is that elements, attributes, and attribute values, that is the part of the attribute that's between the quotes, they're defined to have certain meanings or semantics. And then it gives some examples that we'll talk about. And then it says in the second paragraph, these definitions allow HTML processors such as web browsers or search engines. Remember, we talked about user agents like browsers and Googlebot. To present and use documents and applications in a wide variety of contexts that the author might not have considered. And here's the first part of the benefits of resetting your mental model and breaking bad habits. By authoring good HTML, by adding semantic meaning to your documents, you're helping to make the HTML future-proof, the document future-proof. In other words, who knows how this document will be consumed in five years or 10 years or more. It could be by spoken word. It could be some other medium. And so 
by simply providing the meaning and not just being focused on how a web page looks visually. We're making sure that any future use has the information it needs to present the document to the user in the clearest, most accessible, best way possible. So by being a good HTML author, you're actually extending the life of whatever project you're working on. Make sense? All right, let's move on. It's time for another conceptual aside. Author versus implementer. Let's take a look at section 1.4, audience, of the HTML specification. I've zoomed in on it in my browser so you can see it more easily. But let's take a look at it in even more detail. It says that this specification, the HTML specification, is intended for authors of documents. Hey, that's you and me. As we said, we are HTML authors. Our job is to mark up the documents. And it also mentions implementers of tools that operate on pages that use these features. So implementers of tools, that's interesting. For example, people that make web browsers, the people that are in charge of making user agents. And there's also tools that establish the correctness of documents. If a document is marked up and that markup is accurate according to the specification. So another way to think about it is that an author writes and adds meaning to the document while an implementer may be creating a user agent or tool of some kind which will communicate the document to the user. We're working together, authors and implementers. We're following the specification when we add meaning and implementers are following the specification when they interpret the meaning. You are reading the same specification the people that are making Google Chrome and Safari and Microsoft Edge and Firefox and more, the same specification they're reading and following. And you can be just as skilled at understanding the elements of HTML. Let's move on. Let's talk about content models and kinds of content. Big word alert. A content model, a description of the element's intended contents. In other words, when you're looking at an element, we know that that includes the entire element, including its contents. So the content model is what we all agree, that is what the specification says, is allowed to go in there. You can't just put anything, any other type of element in the specification. In fact, the specification details what can go inside each element, the content model. Switching back to the HTML specification under section three, go to section 3.2.5, content models. And it says what we expect. Each element has a content model. We can scroll down a little ways and find a list of those kinds of content. Metadata, flow, sectioning, heading, phrasing, embedded, and interactive. At the time of recording this course, there's even a helpful diagram. So I can hover over sectioning and see the elements that are that type of element. There's heading and flow, interactive. So heading elements are also flow elements. Section elements are also flow elements. Some metadata elements are flow and some aren't, etc. But what will happen is that each element will describe what categories can go inside of it. So a particular element will accept sectioning and metadata or heading or flow or phrasing. In this way, we can understand what should be allowed by category inside each element. So we'll see this as we go along, and this is simply to avoid confusion. We'll talk about a great number of these categories and the elements that belong to them. They're a way of explaining each element's 
content model. So get familiar with these phrases, metadata, flow, sectioning, heading, phrasing, embedded, interactive. We'll see them all as we go along. And now I bet you're ready to start writing some HTML, to start authoring some HTML. Let's move on. It's time to start authoring some HTML documents. In this section, we'll begin by laying out the basic element structure that most HTML documents have in common. We'll begin by creating our HTML file. Here's my folder open in Visual Studio Code. I still have my resume.txt file. I'm going to create a new file called index.html. I call it index because on most websites, when you go to that website, by default, this would be the first HTML page that would be delivered to the user. So it's my starting point, index.html. As you go throughout this course, then we'll be taking the contents of resume.txt, moving it into index.html, and marking it up. So I encourage you to have this ready and follow along and do it yourself as well. To begin with, let's look at the doc type for our HTML document. The HTML specification says this, that doc types are required for legacy reasons, meaning to deal with previous versions of HTML. If you don't include it, then a browser might render it in a different way than expected. We want to tell the user agent that this is a standard modern HTML document. And we want it to follow the current specification. That's a lot easier than it used to be. You just put this at the top of all of your HTML documents. So let's do that. I'm in my index.html. I'm going to type, oh, notice that? Visual Studio Code knows that this is an HTML document, so it starts trying to help me. It shows me the exclamation mark doc type, so I just hit tab, and it actually fills it all in for me. This again is telling the user agent that what I'm about to give it, the rest of this document, is standard modern HTML. So make sure you don't forget this in your HTML documents, but that's all you need. It's time for our first HTML element, the root of our HTML document. Over in the HTML specification, we'll go down to section four, the elements of HTML, and we'll be in there for a while. The very first element listed is the HTML element. Notice that as part of the specification, every element starts with some details about it. For example, the content model for the HTML element is it must contain a head element followed by a body element. There can be other things that go inside body and head, but that's the content model for the HTML element. So what is the HTML element? Let's zoom in. The HTML element represents the root of an HTML document, and there's that vocabulary of trees coming up, remember? Authors are encouraged to specify a lang attribute, which represents the language the document's being written in, not the markup language, the actual language like English or Spanish. This aids in speech synthesis tools, tools that read the document aloud to a user, or translation tools. You may see things translated on Google Translate, for example. Again, we're providing an attribute that provides further information or instruction in addition to the meaning that the element provides. If we go back to the specification, there's often examples. So there's an example of the HTML element along with the lang attribute. That's in EN for English. Now you might be curious to know what all these abbreviations are for various languages. This is where you should start digging around in the specification. For example, here it says authors are encouraged to specify a lang attribute, and that's a link. So I click on the link, and it explains that it must be a 
valid BCP47 language tag. So then I can click BCP47 to find out more or Google it to get that list. For the sake of this course, we'll be just doing an HTML element with a lang attribute of en for English. So let's do that. HTML lang equals English. Then I'll finish the tag and Visual Studio Code does something nice for me. It adds the end tag, the closing tag, as it's called. There we have it, the beginning of our HTML markup. Let's talk about metadata. Big word alert. Metadata, a set of data that provides information about other data. For example, this is my last name and my first name. That's data. These are labels that describe each. That's metadata, data about other data. And the HTML specification provides for adding metadata to your HTML document. That is data about your document. Under the elements of HTML in the specification, there's document metadata right after the HTML element. The primary is called the head element. The head element represents a collection of metadata for the document. So you'll have a head element, and that will contain inside of it all of your metadata. There's a meta element that you can use for various metadata, and some metadata is so common it has its own element, in particular, the title element. Let's look at the title element. Let's zoom in. The title element represents the document's title or name. Authors then need to think about this title for when the document is used out of context. For example, if a user bookmarks the page, the document, in their favorites, what's listed in the favorites will be the title. If Googlebot comes and looks at the page, in the Google search results, what will be listed is the title. Notice this isn't the title that appears on the page itself, but a piece of metadata, the title of the document. The document's title is often different from that first title that appears on the page. For example, in ours, we started with resume, but that wouldn't be the title of the document. I'd want more clarity than that in a Google search or in someone's favorite. There can be no more than one title element per document, and that makes sense. If we go back and look at meta elements, there's a variety of them, but one of them is quite standard, and that's the character set attribute for a meta element. Big word alert. A character set, a set of supported characters, that's numbers, letters, and symbols. UTF-8, covers almost everything in every language. So with the meta element, you say, the character set I'm using is UTF-8, and that means it will expect that character set for the content of your document, and that character set pretty much covers everything, so you should be safe. And that's a standard way to start your HTML document from a metadata perspective. Let's try. Inside my HTML element, I'll add my head element, which is my collection of metadata. I'll add a meta element with a car set attribute, and the value is UTF-8. And the title element, I'll say resume of Tony Alisea. That's is what would appear in a Google search or in someone's favorites bar. Notice that some elements don't have to be closed in HTML, like the meta element. And that's it. There's the metadata for our document. Time to get into the content of our document. Under the elements of HTML, there's the body element, where we start talking about sections. The body element represents the contents of the document. And it comes after the head element, as we know from the content model of the root HTML element. 
So let's do it. Within my HTML element, I'll add my body element after my head element. And inside here, we'll go all the content of my document. When we think about the content, it's basically what the user is reading or hearing or taking in. The other aspect of that would be the title. We didn't mention in the previous video that the title element also appears in the title bar in the browser, the title of the tab. So that's also seen by the user. But principally, it's what comes inside the body element. Now, here's just one thing to look at. I want to make sure that you're still thinking about trees. We have a root HTML element and two children, head and body. The title is a child of head. So we can see how this looks like an upside down tree. And we can think about our vocabulary. Body is a sibling of head. Head is the parent of title. Head and body are children of HTML. Is that all making sense? This is just a quick double check. Keep it in mind and we'll keep on going. It's time to start adding content to our HTML document. In this section of the course, we'll look at how we divide a document into sections. To begin talking about sectioning our document, let's talk about the outline. For starters, remember this image from content models? We'll be talking about some sectioning and heading elements. But to understand those properly, let's go to section four under sections 4.3 and go to headings and sections creating an outline. Let's zoom in. As part of zooming in, let's think about our document. Our document has a body, that's a section. And it has other subsections, for example, services, skills, and work history. That's the document that we're going to be marking up. You can think of these as sections, and you can think of this list of sections kind of like a table of contents or an outline. You should build your sections and headers in your document, imagining in your head that some tool is going to automatically create a table of contents from your document based on the sections and headers you put in it. That will put you in the right frame of mind to add sections and headings in the right way. Now, zooming in on what the actual specification said, the outline for a sectioning content element or sectioning root element consists of a list of one or more potentially nested sections. And the section is a container that contains some other nodes. All right, wait, we need to break some of this down. Big word alert. A sectioning root. This is a node in the tree that represents the root of a new section of the document. Remember, we're thinking of our HTML as a tree data structure. Just to make sure we understand, there is an element called section, but the section element is not the only kind of element that can be a sectioning root. So don't get confused. The section element is not the only way to create a section of your document. Now we can look at the tree and think of a portion of the tree or subtree as having its own root, a sectioning root. So the root of the tree, of the upside down tree there at the top, but the highlighted element, the highlighted node, might actually be some kind of sectioning root. Say a section element or some other element that we'll talk about. So this becomes kind of its own tree in a way. You could think of it that way. This root contains other elements and forms a section of the tree. And that section would appear in a table of contents or an outline. If we were to use a section element, it might look something like this. It also says that there are potentially nested sections. So you could have a sectioned off area of the document that then has subsections. And that all makes sense. 
we do this when creating documents in various ways. The other thing that was mentioned was a container. Big word alert. A container is an element that has other elements nested inside of it. So which are the containers in this tree? The root is a container. It has elements inside it. So does body and these two sections. Currently, I'm showing an empty head section. So technically, it's not a container. But it will be. And again, as we think about these sectioning roots that contain other things that section off the document, we can also think of them as an outline. So let's dive deeper into the various elements that make up hypertext markup language. We're starting with self contained compositions or the article element. First, now that we're getting into these aspects of the HTML specification, let's talk a bit more about the elements of HTML. We've already seen head, the HTML element, title, body. Realize that this list, the elements of HTML, is kind of the dictionary that we were talking about before for the language. These are the words in the language, that is, the tags you can write that form these elements. You aren't supposed to use any other tags, just like you can't make up words in another language, because each of these tags has a meaning. So we'll look at a variety of these elements, but we won't look at all of them. You'll note there's quite a bit, but we will look at the ones you're most likely to come across, and you'll gain an understanding of how to read the specification for each element so that you can continue to teach yourself with other elements or even as new elements are added to the spec. We'll start by looking at the article element. The specification tells us a few things. What category does this element fall into? So this means I can write an article start and end or opening and closing tag, and that will form an article element. The article element itself is considered flow content. We'll see that flow content, if I click on it, is really a big list of possible elements. You can think of flow content as essentially the document flowing from top to bottom. The sectioning content is another category that this element falls into. And sectioning content is content that defines the scope, essentially, of the outline that we just talked about. And article is also palpable content. Palpable content means it's expected generally that there is something inside this element, that the element won't be empty. There'll be other elements inside of it. We also see the context in which this element can be used. It's expected to be used where sectioning content is expected. And that makes sense. We're using the article element to section the document. And then the content model. What goes inside an article element is any kind of flow content. So any of these tags, any of these elements are allowed to be inside an article element. Now we look at the meaning. Here we're into semantics. What does an article element represent? Interestingly, the word represents is a link. And that just says elements represent things. That is, they have intrinsic meaning, also known as semantics. We've seen that already, but I just wanted to show you the specification talks about it. So an article element represents something. What does it represent? Let's zoom in. The article element represents a complete or self-contained composition. Well, what does that mean? Well, your document can have many sections, many pieces. Some examples are a forum post, an article, a blog entry, a comment, something that is complete in and of itself. In other words, if you took that piece out of your document, it could be its own document and still make sense. Now, that sounds like something you have to look at and make a decision on. And it is. A big part of being an HTML author is looking at the content 
and deciding what tag, what element works best for that piece of the content. So we have to look at our content and make a judgment call. Does this section of the document match the meaning of an article element? Then I'll mark it up as an article. So here's Visual Studio Code. I'll go over to my original document. And I already know that I feel that things like services, skills, work history are sections of the document. So I'm planning on marking those up with some kind of sectioning elements. But is there anything that lives by itself that I would consider just an article? Well, this is a judgment call on my part, and it would be a judgment call on your part, and you might come to a different decision and that's okay. What I'm going to say is that this part right here, where it's just me saying, hi, I'm Tony Alisea, happy to have you as a student. It has my name, it's complete. I'm calling it an article. It's kind of like a comment in this document, and the specification showed that as an example. My feeling is that an article element would best mark up the meaning of this paragraph. So I'll go to my HTML, I'll say article, and then I'll put in that portion of the document. So I've engaged in some authoring. I've taken a portion of the document and marked it up to give it meaning. And really I've done two things. I've said this is its own section of the document and it's a self-contained composition. Make sense? Let's move on. Here's another HTML element that has to do with breaking the document down into sections. This is thematic groupings and the element conveniently called the section element. Back to the specification, we go into the section element, and it's just like the article element. It's flow, sectioning, and palpable content. That's what it is. And it can contain flow content. And let's make sure we don't get categories and content model confused. Category is what the element is. Content model is what the element can contain. So a section element could contain another section element because it can contain flow content and the section element is flow content. Now let's scroll down and look at what the section element represents. Let's zoom in. The section element represents a generic section of a document or application. And in this context is a thematic grouping of content. What does that mean? Well, it means that all the content within the section element should be related to each other thematically. Remember, we're authoring a document, so we're not talking about mechanics. We're talking about the actual content. Does everything that sits inside the section element go together in a thematic way? Does it make sense that it should be considered part of the same section of the document? Now, this sounds pretty similar to the article element which was a self-contained composition. But a section is just a thematic grouping, not necessarily something that makes sense on its own. So the big question often is section element or article element? And the answer is, it depends. Oh no. You might be used to more hard and fast rules in other areas of technology. But when it comes to HTML authoring, you have to make choices and you have to do your best. And really, that's great. That means that part of being an HTML author is getting to know your content, trying to make good decisions, working with team members perhaps that also have opinions, coming to a conclusion together. Those can be fun conversations. So let's look at our HTML document and decide how I want to use the section element. I'm going back to my original text document and thinking about what counts as thematic groupings. For example, services. This is a thematic grouping. This together is talking about the services I provide. The same thing with skills. This together is talking about the skills that I provide and the work history. Maybe even each individual item in the work history could be 
its own section? I'm not sure about that, but the entire work history itself certainly can be. Same for testimonials. Maybe even this area up here at the top, but not the first line because that's my title. All right, let's give this a try. I'll take this thematic section. I'll put resume at the top. That was my title. It's not going to get marked up yet. And I'll drop this in. Now, you may notice that it's not formatted. There's a couple ways to do this in Visual Studio Code. One really nice way is I can select the element, right click, and format selection. That looks better. Let's keep going. Services. This will come after the article. It's a section. I can also select the portions that aren't where I want them and then just hit tab until they're where I need them. Let's keep going. Skills. This will be its own section. Again, I can select it and format selection. How about this whole work history? I could just tab it over. Portfolio, well, that's going to be its own section. And testimonials, that goes together. Everything inside this section element is a thematic grouping. It's the title and each of the testimonials. And lastly, mailing address. For now, yeah, I'll put that in its own section. That's a thematic grouping. All right, this is looking pretty good. I'm actually going to put some spaces between the sections just to make this easier for me to read and between the article there. What do you think? I've got my HTML root and my metadata in the head, my body with its content, and now I'm starting to section off these various areas of the document. I've actually got all of the document's contents in now. I've also decided that this portion could stand by itself, so I'm calling it an article instead of a section element. And if you imagine the outline of this document being created, you could sort of imagine that this would be contact info, Services, skills, work history, portfolio, testimonials, mailing address. That's a table of contents that makes sense to me. So I think we're doing pretty good at marking up this document, adding meaning semantically. Our next element is designed for marking up tangential content. This is the aside element. Back to the specification, and we'll jump down to the aside element. It has the same content model as section and article, and it's a member of the same categories. We scroll down to see what the aside element represents. Let's zoom in. The aside element represents a section of a page, so it's sectioning content, but a section that consists of content that is tangentially related to the content around it, and could be considered separate from that content. Well, that's interesting. Let's take a look at our HTML document. Is there anything in our HTML document that's tangential, meaning it's a comment that's there, but it's kind of separate and not really the main theme of the document? Well, this is a resume, so it's all about understanding me and getting in contact with me. Most of these things seem to be directly related to that. But you know, I've got one thing in here that could be considered tangential. It's my motto, don't imitate, understand. That's not really directly related to my resume. I have it in the document, and it's not really related to the things that are going on. So you know what? I think that this is tangential content. So I'll wrap it in an aside element. You may not agree, but I'm authoring this document for myself. You can author your own. Now, I want to stop for a moment 
and double check something. You aren't thinking visually, are you? Especially if you have some experience with HTML already, you might be thinking about this as far as how you would present it visually. Oh, I might put it in a box off to the side. Stop. We're not talking about visuals. That's just how a particular user agent is presenting the information to its user. We're marking up the document in a future-proof way. Maybe in the future, this gets read aloud to someone and this is read in a different tone. Maybe this gets printed and the aside is placed as a footnote. Who knows? All I'm saying is that this particular piece of the document is tangential content. It's off to the side and not directly related. And then it's up to the user agent, which is programmed to do the best it can for its particular set of users, present that information with that meaning conveyed in whatever format that might be. Oh, and one other thing from a more technical authorship standpoint, is it okay to put the aside element inside the article element? Is that allowed according to the HTML specification? How would you figure that out? Well, we'll go back to the specification and note that the aside element is flow, sectioning, and palpable content. That's the type of content it is. That's its category. And you might recall that the article element, its content model allowed for flow content, just like this does. So an article element allows flow content inside of it, and an aside element is flow content. Therefore, this is legal. The aside element is flow content. The article element's content model is you're allowed to put flow content inside. So this is still a legal HTML document. Let's move on. Now let's talk about adding headings to our sections. This is headings and rank, the H1 to H6 elements. In the HTML specification, we can click on the H1 to H6 elements and find that their category is flow, heading, and palpable. Their content model is phrasing. So that's different from article and section and aside. If I click on it, I can see the list of elements that make up phrasing content. Notice, for example, that article and section are not in this list. That means you can't put an article or a section inside one of these H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 elements. These elements represent headings for their sections. Let's zoom in. Heading content, which is what this is, defines the header of a section, and it can do that in two ways. Explicitly, using sectioning content elements, or implicitly, using the heading content itself. What does that mean? Let's suppose that these are two of the headings in my document. Each of these implies a new section. I haven't wrapped the content in a section or article or other sectioning content element. But the fact that there is a header means everything below it is a new section. And that makes sense. When I read a document and see a new header, I understand it's a new section. So it's implicitly defined. On the other hand, I could explicitly define a new section by wrapping the contents, including this header, in a section and content element like section or article. What else does the specification say? These elements have a rank, H1 to H6. H1 is the highest, H6 is the lowest. So we think of this again like a table of contents, like an outline. The subsections would have lower rank than the main sections. The specification also says that when you see a heading of equal or higher rank after the first heading, that's a new section, but a lower rank is an implied subsection of that previous header. In other words, when I see two headings of equal rank, like these are both H2s, I know that's a new section because it's the same rank as the previous one. 
It could also be a higher rank than the previous one. And I still understand, well, that's a new section. And that makes sense. The previous one is a subsection of some other section. So now I've started a new higher section, skills. When they're equal, we can imagine the outline perhaps like this. There's services with its subsections and then skills with its subsections. But when we have a header that's of lower rank than the previous header on the page, that defines a new subsection. It might look like this, services, and then skills would be a subsection. Make sense? It's pretty straightforward, really. You're just looking at the heading rankings and the equal or higher ones are creating new sections while the lower ones are creating new subsections. Let's try adding some heading content to our HTML document. So what counts as our headings? Well, first we have the heading of the entire document itself. Since that's the first heading, that gets an H1, the highest rank. Everything else is subsections, if I think about it like a table of contents. So for example, this section is an H2 because it's a subsection of the entire document. And by the way, it's explicitly defined because I've already wrapped it in a section element, which is one of the section and content elements. I'm going to skip article for now because I'm not sure how to put a header there. But we already essentially have headers defined. I just need to mark them up so it's clear. Services, skills, work history, portfolio, testimonials, and mailing address. So now I've set up explicit heading content for all of the sections of my document, except for this article. And I've respected the rank of the headers, thinking about how this document should be outlined. Make sense? All right, let's move on. Now let's talk about headers and footers for our document and sections. The header and footer are separate elements in the HTML specification. They contain flow content, but can't contain any headers or footers within themselves. We see that on header, and we scroll down a ways. We see that on footer. Headers and footers. So what are they? How are they different from the heading content we've been using? Let's zoom in. The specification says a header element is intended to contain the section's heading elements. And that's not always true, but usually. In other words, they wrap the H1 to H6 elements. They might wrap a section's table of contents or some other heading content, like a logo. As far as age group, we're not going to cover that. But I encourage you to go ahead and look it up for yourself. It's good practice to start reading the HTML specification. Footer element, on the other hand, is the footer for its nearest ancestor. Remember, we're talking about trees, so ancestor would be a parent, a grandparent, etc., along the tree. So whatever its closest ancestor is, it's a footer for that sectioning content or sectioning root element. So not any ancestor, but an ancestor that is section in content, like article or section, etc. And usually it contains information about its section, which is who wrote it. Maybe appendices, license agreements, things like that. The specification is just giving us some examples. We still have to make decisions. Let's try it out for ourselves. Where might I want more of a header and footer in this document? Well. Maybe in the article, maybe I want to do something that has more content. So header wraps heading content. I'll just say about me. And perhaps I want a footer. I'm not sure what's going to go here. Maybe a contact form or something like that. I think that's a reasonable footer content. 
Remember, according to the specification, the footer is for the nearest ancestor that is sectioning content. So this is the footer for this article. And this is the header for this article. And if we go back to the specification, I can see that a header can actually contain flow content. So it can contain more content other than just H1s to H6s. I can have other content that's really I'm defining as the header for that entire section. In fact, if I go down to the example, I can see that I might have a paragraph and an H1. We'll see some of these things later and more. Make sense? So I'm able to wrap multiple pieces of flow content in a header or footer for this section. Great. I'm still just marking up this document, explaining what the content's all about. Now let's talk about addresses, the address element. In the HTML specification, I'll go to the address element and see that its type is flow or palpable. That's its categories. Its content model is it can contain flow content, but with some exceptions. No heading, sectioning, header, footer, address elements. I can see in the specification that it says it represents the contact information for its nearest article or body element ancestor. Let's stop for a moment and back up. This is an example of why it's so important to be familiar with and read the specification. If I said to you, what do you think the address element represents? What would you have said? You might have said, oh, it represents an address. And you'd be almost right, but not quite. You might have misused it. It represents the contact information for the nearest ancestor in the tree that's an article or body. In fact, it even says below, the address element must not be used to represent arbitrary addresses. So you might have a list of postal addresses, but it's not the contact information for that article or for that document. And so it would be incorrect. Is that even important? Well, remember again, we're talking about being future proof. What if one day, the user agent is going to use the address element to quickly send a piece of mail to us. We could be having the wrong address that it's sent to. That's just an example, but use your imagination. We're thinking about the future. We want to make sure that how we're using the element is as intended, and that will help user agents then carry out work with those elements in the future correctly. All right, let's try it in our document. I'll open back up my resume, and I do have an address. It's at the bottom, so I'm going to mark it up with the address element. Now remember, it said that this has to be the contact information for the nearest ancestor that's either an article or a body element. So we can go up the tree. Visual Studio Code is helping us a bit by highlighting the start and end tags whenever I click on one. So addresses, immediate parent is a section, and the rest of these are siblings, other sections, other articles. But if I go up the tree, the nearest ancestor that's an article or body is the body element of the page. That means according to the specification, this address represents the contact information for the document. The document is my resume, and this is my contact information. It's fake, but you get the idea. Make sense? So this markup is valid and appropriate as intended by the semantics. In this section of the course, we'll talk about another set of HTML elements. HTML elements that have to do with grouping things. That is, things that go together. Here's the first example of grouping things. Let's talk about paragraphs, the P element. The specification says that the P element is categorized as flow and palpable content and can contain phrasing content. It represents a paragraph. Let's zoom in more on what the specification says. What exactly is a paragraph grouping? The specification says a paragraph is a run of phrasing content with one or more sentences that discuss a particular topic. 
So a paragraph for one thing groups blocks of text, groups sentences together into a particular topic. This is basically the definition of what a paragraph is in the first place. But it can be used for more than that. It can be used for general thematic grouping. Remember that we said an address element had to be the contact information. So what would you use if the address wasn't contact information, but you still had to put this address in the document? Well, it would be appropriate to use a P element, a paragraph element, because every line, every block of text in that address is related to each other as a particular topic, that is, the address itself. So a paragraph would be accurate to group them together. Let's take a look at our document. I'm going to mark up the document with P tags. I'm going to group blocks of text thematically. You know what? Let's just skip watching me type this time. All right. So in each section, I grouped blocks of text in paragraphs. There's another. There's another. Each of these skills I grouped as a paragraph. These are thematic groupings. Same thing with work history. Each of the quotes under the testimonials. And that's it. Make sense? The paragraph tag is extremely useful and is used quite commonly. All right, let's move on. Hey, by the way, did you notice that the work we did adding paragraphs to our document created a bit of invalid markup? Can you find it in the document? As a hint, you'll want to think about the content models of the various elements that we're using and what type of content each element is. Don't worry if you can't find the invalid markup. We're going to go ahead and leave it in a document for a while because it's going to teach us a very important lesson that won't appear until the CSS portion of the course. We'll just keep going for now, and then later we'll see how understanding how everything really works helps us debug strange looking problems. This next element shows how the examples in the HTML specification can help us a lot. Let's look at quotes, the block quote element. Going in, I see that its categories are flow, sectioning root, and palpable. So it doesn't want to be empty, and it's actually a sectioning root. The block quote element sections off a portion of the document. How? It says the block quote element represents a section that is quoted from another source. So if this is more of a section, how do I use it? Well, we'll just scroll down to the examples. You might have been tempted to put text directly inside the block quote, but the example actually shows that it's better to wrap that text in something else that makes more sense for that text, like a paragraph tag. The block quote is sectioning off this area, saying this is quoted from another source. If we want attribution, that means where is the source from, you would put that outside the block quote. The specification says it. So now we know how to use it properly. The examples in the HTML specification are great. I encourage you to take a good look at them. Now our HTML document then has some quotes. If we scroll down to the testimonials, I'll just replace them with some that I already typed. So you see, I took the quotes, which were already wrapped in P's as they're grouping blocks of text, I, love, etc., blocks of text, and then wrapped those in block quotes to show that they're quotes from another source. If I wanted to say who was the testimonial was, I would do it outside the block quote, maybe in its own P tag. And that's it. That's quotes. Simple enough and appropriate for our resume, it also shows how important it is to take a good look at the specification and how much the examples help us. Here's another way to group things together. Unordered lists and list items. So what's this element? The UL element. 
It contains a content model of LIs or LI elements. So first, the UL represents a list of items where the order of the items is not important. We're changing the order would not materially change the meaning of the document. So a list of list items that you could have in any order and the document meaning wouldn't change if those items were ordered differently. The LIs that the UL contains are list items. It represents a list item. And the context that it's used is only inside certain elements, including the UL or unordered list element. Let's take a look at our document. Again, remember, I'm trying to pick the best elements to mark up my document and express its meaning. So can I use the UL? Do I have any items that really are a list of items and it doesn't matter the order they appear? Well, for example, services. This is actually a list of three items. And if I put training first or app development first, in this case, it doesn't matter. Now, if I had decided to list them by preference or by price or something like that, then it might matter. But in this case, it doesn't. So I'm going to replace this P tag with a UL. And then each item is an LI or list item. So an unordered list that contains three children, each of which is a list item element. Make sense? I can do the same below with the skills. So I'm just going to do that quickly with something that I already typed. There we go. So I have three skills, three services, and their order doesn't matter. When you look at our HTML documents, you know lists are very common. So you might find yourself using lists quite often. And they're easy to understand and use. And they can be really great for the user agent to provide clarity. All right, let's move on. Here's a different type of list, the ordered list. You can probably guess the difference between this list and an unordered list. The ordered list is essentially the same, but where the items have been intentionally ordered. The OL element. Let's take a look at our document. The work history seems like a list that should be ordered. I'm doing it in order of when I worked at a particular company in reverse. So let's update it. There, from OL with LIs for each item in the list. However, going back to the specification, remember how some elements have attributes that can provide additional information. The OL has something called the reversed attribute, and it's a Boolean attribute. What does that mean? Well, I clicked on that phrase and it says, the presence of a Boolean attribute represents the true value, and the absence represents false. So unlike other attributes, I don't set a value. I just put it on the element. And if it's there, that means true. Now, my list of work is reversed. It's descending with the most recent at the top. So I'll switch back and indicate that. There's another attribute called start that is a valid integer, that is a valid whole number. To determine the starting value of the list. One, two, three, does it start at five? Does it start at 10? Whatever the case is. This isn't applicable in this case, so I'll just keep it as it is. So I've marked up my work history as an ordered list because if I changed the order, it would change the meaning of the document. That is, it would change the order that I'm expressing that I worked at these companies and that this is a descending list. Next up, is association lists, which actually involve three different elements, DL, DT, and DD. By now, you know the routine. We're in the HTML specification. I'm going to the elements of HTML to understand the semantic meaning and usage of each element. I'm looking for elements that will make sense for the document that I'm marking up. In this case, we're looking at 
the DL element. Its category is flow content, and its content model is DTs and DDs, essentially. The DL element represents an association list consisting of zero or more name value groups. Big word alert. A name value group is a value or set of values identified by a name or names. Let's use the specifications examples to explain this. I'll scroll down a ways and it gives an example. One entry authors is linked to two values, John and Luke. Here's authors, the name or title, and here's the values, John and Luke. These use the DT and DD elements. Going back, the DT element represents the term or name part of a term description that is name value group. So DT is the title part, the name part of the group. The DD is the actual contents of the group, the description, definition, or value. So let's go back to the DL examples. I'll scroll down a ways. We have, for example, a DL, an association list, which has two different titles, authors and editor. And the values are there are two authors, John and Luke, and there's one editor, Frank. Those get the DDs because they're the actual values. And these get the DTs because they're the terms, the titles, or the names. You can have more than one term or title. For example, two different ways to spell color and then the actual definition. We could do the same for other values, like a timestamp or anything else that we can think of. That would be a name value group. If we switch back then to our document, we can identify website as a name and google.com as a value. Phone is the name or term. Phone number is the value. Twitter is the name or term. And my Twitter account is the value. So I might be tempted to put this inside the DL like this, and then I'll start to break these down into DTs and DDs. But hang on a second. The HTML author in me is saying, is a DL allowed inside a paragraph tag, a P element? So the question is, is DL allowed when we look at the P elements content model? For that, where should we go? That's right, back to the specification. P elements content model, that is what's allowed inside of it, is phrasing content. Now, phrasing content is flow content, but a subset of flow content. If I click it, I see all the elements that make up phrasing content, and DLs are not in that list. If I go back to the DL itself to see its category, a DL is flow content, but it's not phrasing content. That means that a DL is not allowed inside a P tag. So as a good HTML author, I'll simply move it. This still works. It's all part of the same section with my name as the header. Now let's split these up into terms and definitions or values. I'll make some terms. each with a value. Let's do that twice more. And there we go. What do you think? I'm saying I have a set of name value groups where the name is website and the value is google.com, etc. When there's only one name and one value, these are sometimes called name value pairs. But there could be more than one value. For example, if I had two websites, I could put my other website here, and these would both be under website. Make sense? So with association lists, we have a really good example of taking a good look at the specification, looking at the examples to understand it, 
making sure we're looking at the category of the element we're using and that it fits inside the content model of the parent elements. And this is great. Now both a human and a computer can look at these pieces of data in the document and understand its intention. That is how they're related to each other. Oh, one other thing. When we were in the specification, we scrolled past a lot of stuff to look at some of the examples. What we scrolled past was an algorithm. We won't even big word alert that because we won't use it very much, but it's giving clear instructions on how a DL should be processed. Like how do you know that a term has a definition and how do you know that a definition or value has a term or name? This is saying exactly how to process that HTML structure, that tree structure. You'll see these kind of things in the full specification. And they can be interesting and useful to understand, especially if something's behaving in a way that is unexpected. We're not going to get into these very much in this course because it's not really meant for an HTML author, however. It's meant for an implementer. But it is there, and it's good to know about. So going back to our document, looking at our final markup, we also understand that much like sections, order matters. The DT comes before the DD, and the previous sibling of the DD that is a DT is its title. So as soon as I add a new DT, I'm starting a new name value group. I chose to include end tags here, but you may have noticed that the example in the spec didn't require them. That's because the DTs and DDs say the end tag can be omitted if it's immediately followed by another DT or DD. That's true in this case, but I'm still allowed to. So I'll go ahead and do that just for potential future consistency, but you could leave it out if you wanted. Our document is looking good from a markup standpoint. Let's keep going. In this lecture, we'll talk about multidimensional content or the table element. Back in the HTML specification, we go to the elements of HTML. We've looked at metadata, sectioning content, grouping content. We'll look at text level semantics in just a bit, but I'll head all the way down to section 4.9. And there we find tabular data. Big word alert. Tabular, consisting of or presented in columns or tables. In the specification, we go to the table element. And below, we find that the table element represents data with more than one dimension in the form of a table. The table element takes part in the table model and has rows, columns, and cells which are given by their descendants. What does that mean? Well, we can click on the table model and it gives a definition of what that means. A table consists of cells aligned on a two-dimensional grid of slots and they can have widths and heights, etc. There's rows and columns. You probably know what a table looks like. But this is what we mean. This is the table model. Notice that we have rows of information. We have columns of information. And while this is the most useful way to think about a table visually, what we're really saying is that we have points of data, descendants of these various table related elements that lay out the data in a way that shows which pieces of data are related to each other in a row and which are related to each other in a column. For example, there's the T head element, which tells us that all of the elements in that row, the TR element, are headers for each of the columns. So notice that we can then go to the T body, which says this is the actual contents of the table. And we can look at a particular row and then look at each of the cells in that particular row. Its position, as in which child it is, the first child, the second child, the third child, the TR, tells us then which of these match up to each other. So the first TD of each row forms a column. There's also a footer, 
And we can say that a particular cell, the TD, ranges across a number of columns. So we see what's happening on the right, and we can think about it visually as what you see on the left. Again, then, when we think about a column, we're thinking about where that TD sits in terms of which child it is under each row. So each of these first TDs form a column. Going back to the tabular data, we can see then that all of these are defined. The table element itself has a content model of T head, T body, T foot. There's also a caption element, which we won't go into right here, but I invite you to take a look at all of these in the specification to get a good feel for them. Now, the table element is historically heavily overused. And that's something we'll talk about a bit in this lecture and the next. But understand that it is there for a reason. It's there when you want to present information that has those column and row relationships. For each of those elements, you can actually go back and take a look at each of them in the specification. For example, the TR element tells you what context it could be used in and that the content model is zero or more TDs, THs. We go down and it says the TR element represents a row of cells in a table and takes part in that table model. That is the definition of how we define a table according to the specification. The TD is the same thing. It represents a data cell in a table and can span rows or columns. And there's THs, which are like TDs, but they represent cells in the header row. Let's try actually using the table element and its associated elements, all for tabular data, in our HTML document. And then let's talk more about when you would use a table and when you wouldn't. So here we are back in our HTML document. And let's think about what part of the document might be able to be marked up as tabular data, having to do with columns, rows, that whole table model. Well, we have a few lists of things, for example, services, but that's just one piece of information. We have skills, and that's kind of two pieces of information. But you know, when I think of columns, for example, I think about pieces of data that I'd want to scan, look at together, and compare. There's nothing here I'd really want to compare. Now, work history is an interesting one. Here we have the title that I had, the company I worked for, and how long I worked there. So the years that I worked there might be something that could be a column. And the same thing for what my role was. Maybe someone just wants to look down the column and look at what I did. Now, you might notice I'm already starting to think visually. That's because the table element is a very visual focused element historically. But still, screen readers do take advantage of table elements to show that you're in a row, that you're in a column, and you can scan quickly through those particular pieces of information in that order. So I think this is a good candidate for marking up as tabular data. Now, does that mean I have to mark it up as tabular data? Is that the best, the most correct way to mark it up? And the answer is it depends. That's a discussion I might have with others on my team. It's something I might have to come up with myself. I have to think about the user and how they'll consume the data, how they'll want to use the data, and what would be best for them. But for this lecture, Let's try marking this up as a table. First, I'll add the table element, and I'm going to add a header, a body, which will contain the rows of data and a footer. In the header, I'm going to put a row, and the row will have three cells. So the role I had in the company, the name of the company, and the years I was in the company. Now I'll do the body element to save a bit of time. I'll just copy and paste in work I did ahead of time. So I have a table row 
one row, one TR for each of the companies I worked at, and a TD, that is a table cell, one for each of those pieces of data. So notice that matches up. The header is the role I had, the first TH under the TR. So the first TD under the TR is that role. Again, the first TD is the role. Again, the first TD is the role. You get the idea. And then maybe I want some kind of summary row in the footer. I might say the total, but I don't want to summarize the actual role and company, just the years. So I might do something like this. I'll erase the ordered list. And there's the tabular version of my work history. And so I might mark this up this way in this document because this data, this information, this part of the document makes sense to be marked up as tabular data. So that's something for you to think about. Is there pieces of data in your document that make sense to be a table, to be tabular? For example, if someone wants to look at a column and then scroll down through that column or move down through that column in their user agent to quickly jump from data point to data point, then that might be a good choice. But it's not your only choice. Historically, another problem is that years ago, tables were often used for layout. They were used to lay things out visually, to put them next to each other and one under the other. That was terrible. That's not what the table element is designed for, and it's not something you should ever do. We won't even touch it in the CSS portion of this course. But just know that it did exist, and you may run across legacy code that still does that. That's bad. The table is not about laying out things visually. It's about presenting information in a tabular format. Now, there's another gotcha when it comes to tables that I've seen personally in my years as an application developer. Let's talk about that next. Let's keep talking about multi-dimensional content and doing it wrong. This is a table, a visual representation of a table anyway. And when we look at it, we can think about the previous lecture where we talked about the table element and tabular data. But there's another thing that this resembles. If you're a programmer, if you work with application development, you might think of this as a database table, the visual representation of a database table. And this might be the sort of thing that you work in. When we think about all the work that goes into presenting data to the screen. A lot of times, especially in a full web application, it has to do with a database behind the scenes. And there's a lot of work and code that goes into getting that data sorted in just the right way. The code to get that data to the screen to be accurate, perhaps to be summarized, a lot of different things. And it's a lot of things to handle. And a developer might be proud of all that work. They have a good working database and solid bug-free code that presents it to the screen. Now, along the way, someone is acting as the HTML author. That might be the developer. That might be someone else. And their range of skill, well, that's a different question. But someone is authoring the HTML, even if they don't even fully realize it themselves, and they're just adding tags for visual reasons. Either way, they're producing an HTML document. And that document is being consumed by the user agent and presented to the user. Now, here's the danger when it comes to the table element and tabular data. If you are the kind of person that's diving into the database as well, or in your team, you're working with folks diving into the database, the tendency might be to have that be the focus. If there is a database table, a, a table that's storing a bunch of data, and then eventually that data makes it to the user agent, there might be a tendency to say, well, 
its data in the database. And so that's how we'll present it to the user. Look at all this work we did. Look at this fantastic database. And that is a danger. We need to think about data structure versus tag semantics. The two things are different. Yes, a database holds tables. And yes, there is a table element available to you in hypertext markup language. But they're not the same thing. The table element is not necessarily the best choice just because the data is stored in database tables. Instead, once you put on the hat of an HTML author, the database and code need to fade into the background. And you need to think only about what is best for the presentation of that data to the user, the way they need to consume it, the device they'll consume it on, the way they'll be using the data, what they'll be looking for. In other words, not just necessarily a table. Maybe it's an ordered list, an unordered list, an association list. If it was visual, maybe instead of a table, it should be a card. Whatever the case is, once you put on that HTML author hat, the database should fade into the background and the user agent and the user should be what's present in your mind. All that work of database and code was done so that you can abstract all that work away, so that it can fade into the background. The best work does fade into the background and all that's left is the user experience. Make sense? So be an author. Provide the user agent with meaning. Don't just default to the table element because the data happens to be stored in tables in a database. How data is stored does not always match how it should be expressed. And that's the point we wanted to make and the danger of the table element. But if that's the appropriate element for that data in the HTML document, for that user, for the user agent, then by all means use it, but use it judiciously, use it sparingly. All right, let's move on. Now let's talk about our next HTML element, dominant content or the main element. Back in the HTML specification under the elements of HTML, this one appears under grouping content in section 4.4, it's the main element. Well, what is it and what can go inside of it? What it is, is it represents the dominant contents of the document. That means the, as it's called, the main contents. What is the content that is primarily what this HTML document is about? Notice it says a document must not have more than one main element. The context in which it can be used is in flow content, but only if it is a hierarchically correct main element. A hierarchically correct main element is one whose ancestors are either HTML, body, div, or form elements. So in other words, you can't put the main element inside just anything. There should only be one on the page, and it's going to be inside the HTML body, potentially a div or form, which we'll talk about later. So back in our document, really when we look at this document, everything is the dominant content. It's my resume. We know it has to be inside an HTML or body element. So I'll put main there. And I'll actually wrap this entire content this way. If I look again, I can see that I can take this and hit tab while selected line everything up nicely so it's nicely formatted and that's it i've designated all of this as the dominant content now that does mean i could have other content that isn't the dominant content for example i might have an aside outside the main which is maybe some advertisements for my other courses that's not what this page that's not what this html document is primarily about so it wouldn't go inside the main. Make sense? All right, we're not going to have that there, but that's it. That's the main element. 
and we can move on. We've come to an important moment in the course, a moment we've been talking about. This is where we show that all this work we've been doing up till now, methodically, carefully moving through the HTML specification, thinking about our document, that that has been building skill. And you're about to see that you, right now, are already more skilled at HTML, at HTML authoring, than many web developers out there around the world. All right, let's prove it. This is the div and doing it wrong. The div element appears under grouping content. We'll click on that and we'll see that it's flow content and the content model is essentially flow content. What is the div? Well, let's zoom in on the spec. The specification says that the div element has no special meaning at all. It represents its children. So unlike every other element we've seen before, the div element is meaningless. If you wrap an element in a div, you've added nothing. What those elements inside mean is what they always meant. Authors and this is according to the specification, are strongly encouraged to view the div element as an element of last resort for when no other element is suitable. In other words, using a div should be rare. It should not be a go-to, and you should not see it very often in your HTML documents as a good HTML author. Use of more appropriate elements instead of the div element leads to better accessibility for readers and easier maintainability for authors. The specification itself is telling us that using other elements, semantic elements, instead of a meaningless div, will mean it's better for a variety of users who are reading, consuming your HTML document through various user agents, as well as for yourself, for your teams, for those that come after you who have to maintain that HTML document. What do we mean by that? Well, let's think about this section of an HTML document. Just at a glance, you should be able to tell some things. This is a section of the document. It has a header and it's an H2, so it's below the H1 at one level in the outline of the document. And it contains an address, which would be the contact information for the document. And we can see that we're using an association list to describe the website and phone number. Now I'm going to show you exactly what this markup often looks like out there on the internet today. It looks like this. What do you think? of this markup, knowing what you know about the div element. Well, we can see that there's a header, and then we see a bunch of divs. From a pure authoring perspective, this makes no sense. It's, it's meaningless. Why would you ever think to mark up the document this way? It's the semantic equivalent of putting out your document out into the world, and when the user agent asks, what does this mean? What should I do with it? You just kind of go, eh, blah, 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 you know, eh. It's meaningless. And not only is it more difficult for the users to then get good information from it, consider if you had to go back and edit this content, figure out what it was doing, which one do you think is easier? The one on the left or the one on the right? I hope the one on the left is obvious to you. Now, if you're new to HTML, this may seem silly, but there are many, many, many websites out there today, many, many HTML authors today who are writing the HTML you see on the right. That's because they're focused entirely on making things work visually. 
And so they're using the elements just as hooks for CSS, which we'll see later in the course. That's incorrect. We are good HTML authors. We are marking up the document to add meaning, to describe the document. So we've reached a big moment in the course. All this methodical, careful, deliberate consideration has brought you to skill. Even if you were already an experienced web developer, you may have been writing HTML that looked like all those divs in the past. And I hope that's the end of that particular journey for you and the beginning of a better journey to more maintainable and accessible HTML documents. But there are so many out there, even experienced developers who are writing that kind of HTML. So this is why it's a big moment. You are thinking as an author. You are thinking about describing and adding meaning to the document. You are not thinking visually, which would really be the same as saying, I'm only thinking about one user agent, that is the browser. No, you are thinking about the future. You are thinking about other user agents currently being in use. You're thinking about your users. You are already more skilled in HTML authoring than many web developers. Because if you look at that markup that was all divs and that just looked wrong to you, you've developed the skill of HTML authoring. And I congratulate you. So thank you for moving with us, moving together through the HTML specification. I hope that's something that you hold on to and continue to do, to write good HTML documents, to author good markup. Now, will we ever use a div? Well, we're not even going into our HTML document in this lecture because we're going to try through the rest of this course to the extent possible to avoid the div element. It's the element of last resort. But if you're wondering when you might use a div, well, there's an example in the specification. We can scroll down and we see an example where we have an article, a self-contained article in a particular language. And then we have a couple of paragraphs written in a slightly different form of English than American English. You can see the different spelling. And so that's been wrapped in a div to show that it's a different language. There is no HTML element to say this is in a different language. There's only an attribute. So we need an element to wrap it in, but an element that doesn't add any other meaning because we're not trying to add any meaning here. We're just trying to get the attribute around it. This is a good use of div. But as you can see, it's a very specific situation where we need an HTML element, but we don't want to add meaning. And that's unusual. All right. And now we're ready to move on together. We've hit that big moment. And there's still more hypertext markup language to look into. Let's move on. Up until now, we've been adding markup to our document to describe things like sections and lists. But we don't want to forget that at its core, an HTML document is still just a document that often primarily is text. And there are HTML elements designed specifically for getting down into the text itself. And that's what this section is about. In this lecture, we do something for the very first time in this course, something you've probably been waiting for and get ready. We're finally ready to start opening the browser to use the user agent that presents the HTML document visually. So for our first element, as part of text itself, let's look at emphasis or the EM element and get ready to open your browser. This time in the HTML specification under the elements of HTML, I'm going to head to 4.5 text level semantics. And we'll look at 
the EM element. So what is the EM element? It can contain phrasing content. The EM element represents stress emphasis of its content. And the more EMs you wrap a piece of content in, the higher that level of stress. It changes the meaning of the sentence. So here's a great example in the specification. Let's just look at it real quick. I might have a paragraph that says cats are cute animals. If I emphasize the first word, maybe somebody is saying dogs are cute animals. And then the emphasis would be cats are cute animals. That shows what we mean when we are presenting the sentence. If the stress is moved to the verb, maybe someone is saying cats aren't cute animals. By putting it on the R, we can imagine speaking it out loud as cats are cute animals. There's the emphasis. And so forth and so on. By changing where the emphasis is placed, we change the meaning of the sentence. And so here's how we see that it's still part of the semantic concept. We're changing the meaning of the document, but we're doing it down at the text level, looking at the individual words and phrases in the document. If we go down further, notice it says the EM element isn't a generic italics element. Sometimes you just want to make the text stand out from the rest of the paragraph, but not actually emphasize it. And it says use the I element. Let's click on that. The I element is also part of this text level semantics. And remember how we said that HTML has had some bumps along the road? This is one of them. It was an element called I because it was meant for italics, but that's visual. These days, the I element represents an alternate voice or mood, a different quality of the text. For example, you might have a scientific name that you want to show is in a different voice or mood than the rest of the sentence, but that's not the same thing as emphasizing it. And in neither case, is it a generic italics? Because that would be thinking visually. So, in most cases, we're going to use EM in our document in this course. But why are we concerned about saying that it's not a generic italic element? Let's look at our code. Where might I want to place some emphasis? Well, at a text level, for example, I say, hi, I'm Tony Alisea, and I'm happy to have you as a student in my course. And I'd like to emphasize that I really am happy to have you as a student in this course. So I'd say, hi, I'm Tony Alisea, and I'm happy to have you as a student in my courses. That's emphasis. I did it with my voice, but how might you do that visually? Well, hopefully you already have the live server extension installed in Visual Studio Code. If you don't, you should install it. And then in the bottom right, there's a go live button where it will run the server. So that will essentially turn our computer into a kind of mini version of the internet. And the browser will open this HTML file as if it was retrieved from the internet and show it in your browser. What do you think this word happy will end up looking like when we open our browser? Well, it's time to do it for the first time. Let's click the button. Here's my HTML document shown visually in a user agent. The user agent in this case is Google Chrome. Let's look for the word happy. Here's what the user agent decided to do with the EM element. It decided the best way visually to represent the emphasis that I'm saying I want is to make it italicized. Make sense? I'm not telling the browser to italicize this. I'm telling the browser I want to emphasize this. And it's the user agent that's been programmed on the best way to show that emphasis. And I could change what that decision is. We'll see that later with CSS. We can see, for example, the headers that we have, the association lists, and how the browser has determined to show those. 
with the term and the definition, the name value pairs. We can see, for example, my emphasis. We can see the unordered lists. We can see the ordered lists that has the numbers in front of them automatically. All of these are decisions that have been made as to how to present the HTML document in a visual way. But now I hope you see that your choices in marking up the document are not visual choices. They were choices about meaning. And if we make good choices about meaning, we're working together with the folks that make Google Chrome and other browsers so that meaning is conveyed in the best way. And if someone is using a different kind of user agent, for example, something that reads out loud, we're still helping that user agent make the best choices. So I hope you never think of EM as italics. I hope you think of it as emphasis. And whether to italicize or do something else is a choice on the user agent side. A sequence we often see with many web developers out there is they think, I want the user agent to show italics. So they mark up the document with an EM element. And then the visual user agent, like a browser, shows italics. That is wrong. You are going to do better than that. Your thought process is, this part of the text in the document should be emphasized. So you mark up the document with EM, and then the visual user agent, the browser, chooses to show italics. You see the difference? This will make your markup more future-proof. You'll be thinking as an HTML author, and you'll do better in the long run. All right, let's move on. Here's our next element, importance, or the strong element. Going again to text level semantics, I'll go to the strong element, which can contain phrasing content. And it represents strong importance, seriousness, or urgency for its contents. Now, this is different than a header. This is text level. There's some examples in the specification. Notice the strong can be used inside a header. It's about marking something as important, as urgent, or as distinguishing from the rest of the text. Much like EM, there's another element that used to be used in the bumpy time of HTML called the B element, which originally was about bolding text, but that again was thinking visually. Now we talk about it as drawing attention without conveying extra importance or different mood. So for example, perhaps keywords in the text might be marked up with the B element, but we don't really mean that they're more important or urgent or meaningful. Going back to strong then, we can see that seriousness could be used for a warning or caution notice, Urgency to denote contents the user needs to see sooner than other parts of the document, etc. Let's take a look at our HTML document. Here in my resume, what might I want to mark up as important, urgent, serious? How about this right here? Tony's courses helped me get a job under testimonials. I think that helped me get a job is something I want people to see immediately or hear or read immediately. It's important. It's serious. It may be urgent for some people. They may be taking a course to help them get a job to take care of themselves or their families. So to me, I want to mark this up as strong. Now, what do you think will happen in the browser? You might have guessed when I go down, the browser chose to take the text marked up as strong and to make it bold. That's the visual choice by default in this user agent. Once again, just like EM, our thought process is not, I'm adding the strong element to make it bold. Our thought process is, I'm adding the strong element because I think this is serious or urgent. And then I'll let the user agent decide how to express seriousness or urgency to the user. 
Our next element is side comments or the small element. Over in the HTML specification under text level semantics, I'll click on the small element. And looking down, we see that it represents side comments, such as small print. That might be a disclaimer, copyrights, attribution. The specification says it doesn't de-emphasize or lower the importance. So if you're trying to say something isn't important or isn't urgent, don't use the EM or strong, which we've covered. It's not for subheadings. It's not for long spans of text, such as multiple paragraphs. So we see it's clear usage. Let's take a look at our HTML document. Is there anything I might mark up as small? Well, I've already marked up my motto, don't imitate, understand, as an aside. It's tangentially related. But I also think that it's a side comment. It isn't really about my resume. That's why it's an aside. And it's kind of a side comment from me. So I'm choosing to mark up this phrase, don't imitate, understand, as both an aside, as tangentially related, because it is related to my courses. That's the motto for the courses. But also as something that's just a side comment. So notice it's OK to mark up text with multiple elements if they all apply. Do you agree that this should be marked up as a small element? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's OK. The important thing is that we're making semantic decisions. How does the browser choose to display this to the user? Well, no surprise, it decides to decrease the font size. That's how this user agent is choosing to express my intent of saying that this is just a side comment. Hey, quick question. Did you ever find that bit of invalid markup that we left in the document? If you haven't yet, as a hint, we focused on the area of the document that is invalid in the previous lecture. We're still going to go ahead and leave it in because there's still more that we need to learn and properly understand in order to debug a strange looking problem that will appear in the CSS portion of the course. So let's keep going and learning, and you'll see later that a proper understanding of how things really work will give you a superpower, the ability to quickly debug problems. A lot of coding education focuses on how to build things, but a huge part of your life as a web developer will be figuring out why something isn't working the way you expect. And that I've found over the years is where don't imitate understand can make a huge difference. So let's keep going. Our next element involves line breaks, or the BR element. Going back to the specification under text level semantics, I can find the BR element. What is the BR element? It represents a line break. That sounds visual. Notice what the specification says. While they're usually represented in visual media by physically moving subsequent text to a new line, a user agent could be justified in taking that BR and displaying it in a different way, maybe green dots, maybe extra spacing. So even though it sounds like a visual element, it really could be expressed visually in a variety of ways. But we have to be careful. For example, here's the correct use of the BR element, using it for line breaks in an address. But it shouldn't be used for separating thematic groups within a single paragraph. Remember, a paragraph element comprises a thematic group. So for example, I might have a list of comments and then something to click on to add a comment. Those are two separate thematic ideas. Here's how many comments we have, and here's something to add a new comment. The same here with this form, which we'll see more later. We have the idea of inputting your name and inputting your address inside a single P tag with the BR to separate them. But these are really separately thematic. One is for the address, and one is for the name. Those are two separate things. That means these examples, as the spec says, are non-conforming. Big word alert. Non-conforming means 
does not match the standard. So those examples we saw in the specification don't match the standard. They don't match the intention of the elements. So they're non-conforming. That markup is non-conforming. The correct alternatives shown in the specification are simply having each of these thematic groupings as their own key tags instead of using a BR. Make sense? This would then be HTML that conforms to the specification. Let's try it out in our HTML document. Where might I want to use a BR? Well, I have an address. And these aren't two separate thematic groupings. The entire address, I think, is one theme. You need both together. So I'll put a BR. And that's it. I think that's conforming. What do you think? Oh, you might have noticed the specification didn't put this little extra slash on the end. That's not necessary, but I wanted to show you that in some cases, you can write an element as self-closing. Big word alert. A self-closing tag is a tag that is both a start and an end tag at the same time. So in this case, the BR both opens and closes itself. Now this isn't actually necessary. It's totally fine to put in a BR this way in HTML. I have an old habit of doing it this way. And both are actually accepted and will work in the browser. Oh, you might have also noticed that if you're still running your live server, whenever you make a change and save the HTML file, the browser automatically refreshes. So you don't have to keep stopping and starting this. So I've made this change. My browser automatically refreshed. And there's my line break here at the bottom. By default, the user agent, in this case, Google Chrome, chose to interpret the VR as a new line. One other note, you may be wondering, why is it that you even need the VR when we already had a carriage return inside our document? However, that's not really how white space is treated. We've touched on this, but let's say I was to put a bunch of spaces in the word mailing address. When I go back to the browser, you'll see that they're ignored except for the first one. In the specification in section 3.2.5, we see that ASCII white space is allowed between elements and is kind of treated like its own element. But any sequence of white space is considered inter element white space, meaning white space between elements. So, one way to think about it is that the single space is allowed, it's treated as its own element. And we could think of mailing as its own element, an address as its own element, but then any space between them are treated as inter-element white space and ignored by the user agent. It's essentially the same as the carriage returns between the tags that we're using to keep this well formatted and easy to use. So to specify that we need a carriage return, we actually have to put in an element that says that's what we want. And there's also ways to add extra spaces and things that we'll see later. This is a good moment to show you a feature of HTML specifically for authors. This is authors comments. In the specification, comments are referenced under section 13, the HTML syntax under comments. But it's easiest to show you. Let's look at our HTML document. An author comment is a portion of the document which is not meant for the user. So user agents will generally ignore them. They're there for yourself and to communicate to other authors. For example, I have an empty portfolio section. So I might want to add a reminder for myself or a reminder for some other author that comes in after me of what needs to happen here. So I start a tag, but I use an exclamation mark and two dashes and Visual Studio Code ends it for me, which is two dashes and then that ending caret. Maybe I put needs pictures. And there we have it, that's it. I have an author comment, something for myself or for someone else. Author comments can be multiple lines and they'll still be ignored.
If we go back to the browser, which is refreshed, you'll see under portfolio, there's no change. Again, the comments are ignored by the user agent. They're not meant to be delivered to the user. Just as a note, be cautious with comments. If they're very large, they're still going to be downloaded by the user agent who's downloading this document. So you could increase the download size quite a bit without actually helping the user in any way. And again, just remember, you start with this exclamation mark dash dash and end with the dash dash on the right side. Don't forget the ending, or you might accidentally comment out a big portion of your document. If I did forget, Visual Studio Code helps me by showing me in a different color that these are actually all comments now. So that can also be a clue. It's time to introduce another element, and this one is very similar to the div element, only it's a text level element. It's overly used and often misused. It's span and doing it wrong. Let's look at a block of HTML. It's a sentence of mine. I love peanut butter. That's true. I do. It's tangentially related to whatever the page it is that it's sitting on. And it's a quote from me. It's a single theme within a paragraph. I'm emphasizing the word love. And I'm making it very important that it's peanut butter and not just any butter. You get all that from the semantics, right? Here's something that we often see all over the internet by many even experienced developers. There you have it. What do you think? Div and span. So what is span? In the specification under text level semantics, I can find the span element. And just like the div, it doesn't mean anything on its own. It represents its children. Now it can be useful when you need to wrap a bit of the document with the particular attribute, like you need to specify the language. There are certainly good uses for the span element. Just like div, it's not wrong to ever use them, but they're so overly used and misused so often, and they're meaningless. So. Combining div and span to handle things only visually is the same thing as just saying, ah, blah, blah, blah. We're not adding any meaning to our document. Plus, if you were to come back to this and you needed to edit it a year later or five years later, or it was someone else's HTML that you'd never seen before, it would be a lot harder to quickly understand what was going on, what was the intention. Wouldn't you rather work on something that looks like this? Doesn't that make more sense and is in line with the intent of HTML? So this is another big moment. It's worth repeating. If that div and span combination looked kind of silly to you, well, you are thinking as an author. You are thinking about describing and adding meaning to the document. You are not thinking visually, just one particular user agent. And you are already more skilled in HTML authoring than many web developers. So congratulations. Let's move on. In this section, the course takes a big turn. Up until now, we've been avoiding opening the browser. We've been focused on tuning our skills as HTML authors. But now, from here on out, we focus on the user agent, we focus on the browser, on how it works under the hood, and how it takes our HTML and presents it to the user. This section is the browser and the DOM. It's time for a conceptual aside. This is HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Big word alert. Hypertext, text that references other text, which the user agent enables the user to immediately access. In other words, I might write a document 
That's a blog post about HTML and CSS. And then I could reference other documents, such as the HTML specification or the CSS specification. And in the case of hypertext, that means that the text of the document, the text of that blog post, now lets the user then go out and immediately gain access or request access to these other documents that I've referenced. And they might reference themselves. They might reference other documents out there available for a user to read. And so all of these links between these different documents form a kind of web or a net. <laughs> well, you already get the idea. Now, what do we mean by protocol? Big word alert. A protocol is a system of rules for two entities to communicate. In this case, we're asking the question, how do we transfer that text, the hypertext, from one computer to another? Well, there's a standard. That is, there's a protocol. The user agent then will follow that protocol and request the text using that protocol, using that standard method of communication, saying, hey, I'd like this text. And then on the other side, that text is delivered using, again, the standard protocol. The thing that's delivering the response is called the server. Big word alert. A server is a computer or software that manages access to services and resources, like documents, images, and video. So you make the request of the server, and then it will decide if that thing exists, and if it does, if you should have access to it. And then if you do, and it does exist, then it will deliver it back via a response. So we're talking about servers out on the internet. What receives the response, what makes the request, is called the client. Big word alert. A client is a computer or software that requests resources or services from a server. So in this case, the user agent is acting as the client. It's requesting the hypertext and then receiving the hypertext and figuring out what to do with it. What do these protocols look like? Well, they're really just text files being transferred around the internet. That's really what we're doing when we're clicking around web pages. A request might look something like this. This is a search on google.com searching for HTML. The request has an address. The request even includes what the user agent is that's making the request, in this case, Google Chrome. A response from a server might look something like this, where it has in the protocol ways of saying, okay, yes, I have this thing that you're requesting, it exists. And then below that, it has the actual contents, which again is just text. Now, what we're showing here is just text, but we're talking about hypertext. So we can now go beyond just text. We can deliver hypertext. We build hypertext using hypertext markup language. But what makes it hypertext is the fact that within that text, you can link, you can reference other hypertext markup documents. So you have the user agent, you have the server, you author HTML and place it on the server. Then somewhere out there, someone using a user agent like a browser will request that HTML document that you've requested, and the server will then deliver it. The user agent will then interpret that hypertext and deliver an experience to the user so they can consume that same text that you wrote and uploaded to the server. 
when we make a request from a website, we're actually already accustomed to specifying what the transfer protocol is. That's why we have HTTP or HTTPS in front of the address that we're requesting, in front of the resource that we're requesting from the server. Hypertext transfer protocol or a secure version of hypertext transfer protocol is what we're using to make the request. And then the request will translate into an address that specifies where to get the resource, the document, et cetera, from. So all of that together comprises hypertext transfer protocol. So big word alert, hypertext transfer protocol, a set of rules for how two entities, client and a server, can transfer text between themselves. Text which can link the user to other related text. And that's where the hyper comes from, beyond text. It's hypertext, it's more than text. That text then is usually marked up or described, given meaning, using a markup language. In this case, hypertext markup language. So let's sum that up one more time. When we say hypertext, the HT in HTML, we're talking about text that goes beyond just standard text, but can reference other documents within it. And we mark up our hypertext documents using hypertext markup language that we've been discussing all along. Now, in the modern age, we send more than just documents. We send images, we send video. Now, that's technically still just text that's then interpreted by the user agent. But as a general concept, that's sometimes called hypermedia, meaning everything that we send across the internet. But all of that is still sent via HTTP. So when we imagine our different documents that are hypertext, text that's linked to each other, we understand that there's a protocol that's being followed when those documents are requested by the user agent and when they are then returned by the server. And every one of those links, every time that document is requested, that's actually an HTTP request. All of this is hidden from us though. We don't have to do it manually. The user agent, often the browser, is handling building that request in the proper protocol, reading the response from that protocol, and delivering the information to us, the user. In this section, we'll talk about one of the most important elements of the internet, the anchor tag. Anchor tags and hypertext, or the A element. Going to the HTML specification to section four, the elements of HTML, we can scroll down to section 4.6, links. And here we're talking about this conceptual concept of a link that represents a connection between two resources, one of which is the current document. And that's what the A element represents, a connection between the current document and another resource. These are typically called hyperlinks, links to other resources exposed to the user by the user agent. So the user can cause the user agent to navigate to those resources. That is, you click or tap on a link, and then the browser goes and gets that resource. Section 4.6.2 states that an A element can have an href attribute, which would be the URL or the address of whatever it is, the resource that we're trying to find. So here in my HTML document, I have at the top, for example, a couple of other resources that I could reference and say, click here in order to go to that resource. So first of all, it would be an A element surrounding the text. And then I can add an href attribute to say, here's the address of where the user agent should go when the user wants to access this reference. I'll do the same thing for my Twitter feed. I'll 
I'll wrap my Twitter handle. And just for completeness, I'll add my YouTube channel. There, I have A elements with href attributes that allow the user agent to inform the user that they can reference these addresses and then go ahead and carry that out if the user chooses to do so. When I open the browser, we can see that the user agent chooses to signify this in what is now an iconic manner, a link, in this case with an underline. So I can click on the link, which is really requesting the user agent to access that resource, which is another HTML document, which is Google's homepage. Make sense? So why is it called an anchor tag, this A element? Well, if you think about these HTTP requests that are generated when we click these links, moving between these documents, the way that we're able to move between the links from one to the other is the anchor. It's anchoring the links. These anchors connect or anchor these documents together. So it really does make sense to call them anchor tags. And remember, these anchors are ultimately what makes this hypertext. And they form the foundation of everything the internet is about. Google, for example, follows hyperlinks to determine what documents are related to each other based on what documents link to each other. And there's much more. Now, there's another aspect to anchors that the specification mentions. It mentions there's a target attribute that can be added to the A element that gives the name of the browsing context that will be used. And user agents use this name when following hyperlinks. We won't even big word alert. We'll just click on it. A browsing context is an environment in which document objects are presented to the user. The note says that a tab or window in a web browser typically contains a browsing context. So this open tab is a browsing context. I can then say what my target is. For example, if I go back here, I can add another attribute, target, and I could say underscore blank. So what will happen? Well, if I give that value as the attribute for target, then the user agent sees that I intend to open a new browsing context. What do you think will happen? I click it. I still get the same requested resource, the HTML document that represents Google's homepage, but it's open in a new tab, a new browsing context. And that at its essence, is the A element, anchor tags. It's time for a conceptual aside. This is user agents, again. Well, we've been talking about user agents for a while, but now we're starting to really look at the browser. So let's make sure we have a clear picture as we go forward. On one side, we have the user. On the other side, we have documents on the internet, and in between, we have the user agent. And as we've seen, there are back and forth interactions on all sides. And the user agent these days really could be a number of things like tablets, phones, laptops, or more specifically, browsers or other programs sitting on these devices, these user agents or UAs, carrying out their jobs of allowing this interaction between the user and these documents. We also know that we're writing markup, and we've talked about how the HTML really matches to a tree-like data structure. So we could start imagining this user agent consuming the HTML and then storing that HTML document in a structured way in the computer's memory in a tree structure. And this will form the foundation of the rest of what we'll talk about. We're reviewing it here to make sure we keep that mental model in mind. All right, let's move on. It's time for another conceptual aside. Now we'll focus on the browser, the internet browser. Ones like Chrome, Safari, 
Firefox and Edge. We've been focused on user agents in general, but now it's time to get specific. There are many internet browsers out there like we've mentioned, but they all have a number of things in common. For example, within the internet browser are a number of what we could consider sub-programs, dedicated areas of the browser that do different types of things. For example, every browser has code dedicated to networking, that is dealing with those HTTP requests, downloading resources, etc. Every browser has a rendering engine. Every browser has a JavaScript engine that runs code that's written to manipulate the web page and many other things. And every browser deals with storage. A browser can store things that it's downloaded, for example, so that you don't have to download it again, among other things. In this section, and really for the rest of this course, we'll be focused on one of these four. The rendering engine. Big word alert. The rendering engine. A computer program that transforms an HTML document into a visual interactive representation of the document for the user. The rendering engine is the system that goes from the HTML and ends up delivering you the web page visually. And this is where our focus will lie for the most part. However, as good HTML authors, we'll never forget that first and foremost, we're writing good markup so that any user agent can interpret it to its user appropriately. But here on out, we'll mostly be focused on the browser interpreting it for the user visually. I'm really excited for this part of the course because here I want to remove some of the mystery. We've been talking about user agents and browsers and rendering engines, but I don't want you to see them as some mysterious black box that just gets things done. I want you to understand how they really work and understand that they're really just computer code being written by other people trying their best to conform to the HTML specification. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that modern browsers share their code with the world. Let's take a look at Blink, a rendering engine. Here I've gone to chromium.org slash Blink. So what is Blink? It says Blink is the name of the rendering engine used by Chromium. And Chromium is a set of technologies that backs the Google Chrome browser. So Blink is the rendering engine inside Google Chrome. If I click rendering engine, it takes me to Wikipedia, which describes it as a core software component of every major web browser, and its job is to transform HTML elements and other resources of a web page into an interactive visual representation on a user's device. Hey, we already said that. So that's what Blink is. And Blink is available to see. It has a link to its code, which lives out on the internet, available for everyone to see. And then you could actually run this code and get a view of how things are working under the hood. Now, this isn't something I expect you to do. It's not something you need to do to learn HTML and CSS, but I want to show it to you, to remove some of the mystery, to gain a deeper understanding of how things are working, which will help you debug problems, which will help you write better HTML and CSS, and will have other benefits that we'll see later in the course. So I've done the work of getting this code running and we're going to run it and take a look at a few things. But first, we need to establish some concepts. Sound good? All right, let's do this. It's time for our very first engine aside. These lectures will focus on the internal workings of the browser's rendering engine. We'll start with the parser. Big word alert. To parse, that is to analyze text character by character. 
We've already said that the browser rendering engine will translate the HTML an author has written into a visual representation, that is, a web page. So where does it begin? Well, it needs to read the HTML. So here's our engine. And we can imagine that it starts reading the HTML character by character. That's what it's programmed to do. And it's going to make determinations based on the characters that it finds. For example, if it finds the less than character, it assumes that this is the beginning of a tag. And then it will move on until it finds a greater than character. And then it will say, well, there's an H1 starting here. And it will keep that concept in its memory. It'll work through the text. And at some point, it finds another tag and sees that it's a closing tag. And when that tag is finished, it understands that's the ending tag, it matches up all these concepts, and then has something to work with. This information is now in its memory, and then the code that then decides what to do with that information can then express appropriately the visual representation. So as you imagine the browser rendering engine reading your HTML, you should be imagining it reading the document character by character. That is to say, the parser, the part of the rendering engine responsible for doing this, parses your text file, that is, your HTML document. We've seen that there's a parser that's looking for special characters that are defined in the HTML specification as how we write our tags and other things. But that means there might be a problem, because what if we want to use those characters for something else? This is named character references. As we've seen, in our HTML document, we have markup and we have text. But what if some of the text looks like markup? For example, if the browser rendering engine is going through and it recognizes the tags, but then maybe we want to put a less than character as part of the text and not as part of the markup. So what should happen? We could try to make good decisions, but it's easy to see that this could get tricky. And HTML has a solution. For starters, we can look at our HTML document. Let's say I add a less than character here in the title in my name. What will the browser do? Well, the rendering engine, when it reloaded the page, parsed this text. And we see that it actually outputted it. After looking at the whole document, the browser rendering engine, the parser in particular, realized that no, this isn't part of a tag. But what if I was writing something like this? Maybe for some reason that was the format I wanted. What would happen? What do you think you'll see? Let's look at what the parser decided. Well, the first less than and the last greater than are shown, but it interpreted this set of less than, then some text, then a greater than as a tag, as markup. So this is potentially an issue. So what's HTML's solution? If we go to the specification under section 13, the HTML syntax, it actually has a whole section on parsing HTML documents. So the people coding the rendering engine can do their best to match the recommendations of the specification. But if I scroll down to 13.5, I get a table of named character references. This is a way to tell the parser what character you want to display without actually typing that character. You put an ampersand, and then you put whatever the code is that's here. So for example, if I want a less than character, I'll see if I can find it. And here it is down in the L's. It's an LT. And you can place a semicolon or not. I always place a semicolon for clarity's sake. Let's try it. I put an ampersand and then the code. 
and you see that Visual Studio Code recognizes that as something special to highlight. I'll do it again. The greater than symbol you might be able to guess is a GT. Save that. And now the parser knows exactly what we're trying to do. Make sense? So you can always go to the specification and look at named character references. When you're trying to use a special character or a kind of character that may actually be part of the HTML language. And the reason for that is so that we can imagine the parser going through this and seeing an ampersand and then the code and knowing what to do, which is very different from how we write our markup. I'll get rid of this, but there we have it. That's named character references. And again, it's related to the rendering engine parsing your HTML. It's time for another conceptual aside. This time it's objects. Big word alert. An object. An object is a collection of data that is information and code that is instructions to a computer that accomplishes things, which together, the data and code, represents something. For example, I could say that a particular object exists in the computer's memory. Let's call it A. But that there's other pieces of data that are associated with or belong to that object also sitting in memory. Maybe a first name and a last name. I could also have computer code sitting in memory or a reference to computer code to be more accurate. That does work. For example, perhaps I have some computer code called introduce yourself that would then look at the first name and last name and produce a string like I'm first name, last name. This would be an object, a collection of data and computer code together that represents something. In this case, the object A represents a person. This is the basic idea of an object. Here's another conceptual aside. This time it's models. Big word alert. A model is a representation of a thing. So if I have a model airplane, it represents a real airplane, or a model car represents a real car. So then we can also have object models. Big word alert. An object model is a collection of objects that represent a thing and provide access to examine and change that thing. We've already seen, for example, that we can have an object that has data and references to code. But let's imagine instead that we're creating an object model. Perhaps we want to create an object model for an online course, like the one you're taking now. An online course has a teacher or teachers. So we could have an object to represent a teacher, and we could have multiple teacher objects if there's more than one teacher. We would have student objects, and there would be more than one student object if we had more than one student. And we might have a video lecture object that represents the video lecture and however many of those there are. By the way, in some programming languages, we would think of this more as object instances and objects, where the object defines the structure and the instance is the actual object. But we're just calling them all objects here. That said, this entire set of objects together represents a thing. It represents an online class. So we could say that this collection of objects is an online class object model. It represents the online class and has all of the information about it. We can use the object model to learn about the class, like who's the teacher and who are the students. And there might be code that these objects provide to let us edit the class, make changes, etc. Since it takes a lot to say online class object model all the time, we might use an acronym like VOCOM or OCOM. But we would know whenever we saw VOM that we meant object model. Now, this is just an example. 
but keep this idea in mind as we move into one of the most important concepts related to the browser when it comes to HTML and CSS. In this lecture, we introduce a new fundamental concept, fundamental technology, that will form the foundation of everything we'll talk about in this course from here on out. This is the document object model. Big word alert. The document object model is an object model that represents an HTML document, providing the ability to examine and change the document as presented via the user agent. So again, that means that we write or author an HTML document and the contents of that document are used to create an object model that represents it, containing some of the same data and information, plus more. Also, with abilities to examine that document, change that document, not the actual original HTML, but what's presented via the user agent. The document object model will generally refer to as the DOM, a representation of the HTML document you authored. Now, really, it's a representation of any HTML document being loaded by the browser, but we're looking at it from the perspective of ourselves as HTML authors. The document object model is what the browser uses to then build the visual representation of the HTML document. Now, what do you think the document object model is structured as? What kind of data structures do you think are involved? Remember, we've been talking about how HTML is well structured as a tree, that a tree representation works well. And so you can imagine that when the browser takes the HTML and creates the document object model, it would make sense that it would also be a tree, and it is. So you'll also hear reference to the DOM tree. In fact, We'll be talking an awful lot about the DOM in a tree structured way throughout the rest of this course, especially in CSS. But for now, let's dig deeper into how the DOM is created from the HTML you author. Let's take a deeper look at how the user agent builds the DOM. This is building the DOM, and we'll take a deep look at Blink. We've already seen that the user agent helps the user to get the HTML document that we've placed on a server somewhere. The user agent requests that document. That document is returned to the user agent. It translates that marked up text and delivers a visual experience to the user in the browser's case. But now we're zooming in a little bit more on those steps. And now we understand that the user agent takes the marked up document and builds the DOM. It builds an object model that represents what was written in the HTML document. So from here on out, as we talk about the browser, as we talk about the visual representation that's presented to the user, the web page, we're not going to think about the HTML document as purely what's being transmitted to the screen. Instead, we're going to adjust our mental model and think about the DOM. The document object model is what is actually being used to transmit a visual representation to the user. Now, how do we get from HTML to the DOM? For that, let's open up the actual code that runs inside Google Chrome. Let's look at the rendering engine Blink. And here we have it. I'm using a program called Visual Studio. Sounds like Visual Studio code, but Visual Studio is bigger and more complex. It can do a lot more things. Blink, like many things inside a browser, is written in a language called C++. So if you're familiar with C++ or languages that are similar to C++, this might look familiar to you. I've opened the code for Blink. 
and we're looking at the parser. We're going to watch as Blink takes an HTML document I've authored and breaks it down character by character and then creates the document object model. Here's the HTML document I'm going to give to Blink, essentially that I'm going to load as a web page. I have a standard HTML structure. I have some meta tags, a title tag, a body, and just an H1 that says, hello world. Let's see what happens when the browser loads this HTML document. Inside Visual Studio, I can watch what's happening as code is being carried out. So as Blink is reading the document, we're going to slow time down essentially and watch what happens. Down here in the lower part of the screen, we're watching as the parser reads in the HTML document character by character. Watch, there's the H, T, M, L, H, E, A, D. What's happening? It's reading in the HTML elements and the head elements character by character. You may even notice that there's some code to deal with what happens when we get to a slash or a greater than caret. There's our meta tags, METAs. We've gotten to the body, B-O-D-Y. We're fast forwarding a bit. There's an H1. And we see that we're closing tags as we go as well as it reads in those slashes. It finished reading the entire document because we got to the slash HTML, the final element. Now it's parsed the document. It understands its contents from a character by character perspective. Now we're going to build the DOM. Blink takes that information from the parser and begins creating objects. The type of object is called an element in this case, in this code. You see that there's a create element that's code being called that creates the element from that text. For example, right now, the element we're creating is the head element. For another element, we might have the meta element. And we can even see the attributes being created for that element. For example, here we have char set UTF-8. That's the name and value. Again, the parser read these in from the HTML, and now it's creating objects that have these values within it as part of the document object model. There's the title object being created. Again, now we're not thinking about the HTML, we're thinking about the objects being created from the HTML. There's the body. There's the H1. Each of these, again, are objects. And after everything has been processed, after the DOM has been created, a whole other set of code works to create the visual representation. And here it is. Hello, world. As we can see, Blink is just code written by other people, the people creating Google Chrome, the people creating a user agent with the intent of delivering the HTML visually. So what we'll take away from this is the understanding that there's no mystery here. It's just other people's code doing their best to follow the specification, doing their best to create a good user agent, a user agent that reads our HTML, generates some objects, and then presents the content. That means this code could have bugs. That means this code could work the way we expect or could work a slightly different way. So we shouldn't get so uptight about what Google Chrome or any other browser does or doesn't do as if it's some black box that can never change. 
these programs are always changing. And we're taking advantage of a whole lot of other people's code when we do our work as web developers. So the next time you open a browser, we can think about all that work that's going on behind the scenes, and we can build a proper mental model, again, of that user agent running code to create the document object model. But not only that, the folks that make these browser rendering engines are also trying to help web developers to build the best experiences possible. So let's dig more into what the user agent does and provides for us the HTML authors. It's time for a conceptual aside. This one is developer tools. We've already seen that browsers are really just computer programs that have a particular goal, the goal of being a good user agent. But actually, the browsers want to do more than that. People making browsers, modern browsers, want to help us, the developers, the people authoring the HTML, writing CSS, creating web applications. They want to help us make that as easy as possible, in part so that we want to use their browser. So again, all modern browsers come with developer tools or dev tools, tools within the program that go beyond just delivering the experience to the user and instead deliver an experience to us. For example, if you Google Chrome developer tools, you're taken to developer.chrome.com slash doc slash dev tools. Here, we actually see the website dedicated to Chrome dev tools, which is a set of web developer tools built directly into the Google Chrome browser. If I was to click the overview, it explains what it is, that they can help you edit pages on the fly and diagnose problems quickly, which ultimately, and here's a goal, helps you build better websites faster. In fact, there's even a blog you can follow and other information. And this is what the website looks like at the time that this course is being recorded. So when we talk about developer tools, think about the people building browsers who are already writing all that code we've been seeing. And think about them writing code and features in the browser designed to help us, the people who are then creating the content and code that's then being interpreted by the browser. Now it's time to start taking a look at some of these developer tools that are available within a modern browser. This lecture is the inspector and digging into the DOM. I've gone ahead and ran our resume from inside Visual Studio Code. Now I'm going to hit F12 on my keyboard. Alternatively, I could open up the menu, go to more tools, and go to developer tools. And here they are. So on one side, we have all the work of interpreting and presenting the HTML document. And on this side, we have a whole bunch of tools provided for us, those that are doing the work behind the scenes. So what are some of these tools? Let's look at two of them. We'll start by going to the network tab. And then I'll make sure that blocked requests is off and that I have all set for the filter. And then I'll refresh the page. And there you have it. That index.html page was loaded. And we see how big it was that was downloaded. If I click it, I can actually see that what the network tab is showing me are the HTTP requests and responses. So here is some of the name value pairs passed around at the top of the HTTP request and some of those that came back in the response from the server. I can go to the response tab and see exactly what the contents of the requested resource is, and it's my HTML. So here I can verify what's actually being downloaded, what's being requested, and what the responses are. We know the browser then takes this response, this HTML, and generates the DOM. Let's go to the Elements tab. So let's zoom in a bit. 
And watch what happens as I hover over different pieces of the HTML that I'm seeing in this element. I can expand them. And then we can see that it's highlighting that portion on the left-hand side that I'm hovering on on the right-hand side. I can keep expanding these and look at each of these elements. I could have right-clicked on any element and inspected it, and that would jump me to that element in the Elements tab in the Developer Tools. Now, here's a question. What am I actually looking at inside this window? Am I looking at my HTML? Well, here's a little clue. If I go down to that last section, the mailing address, and open up the address, you may recall that the BR tag could have or not have that slash inside of it. The BR tag here does not have a slash. But if I go to my actual resume, I did write a slash in the BR. Wait a minute. Let's go back to the network tab. I'll zoom back out. Let's double check what came back from the HTTP request. Right there it is, the BR with the slash. Well, you might notice there's also something injected by live server. This is code so that the web page will automatically refresh after you change the content of the HTML. So we can ignore that. But we see that there's a slash. And when I go back to the Elements tab and I zoom in, we see there is no slash. So what does this mean? What's happening? What's happening is that what we're seeing inside the Elements tab in the Developer Tools is not our HTML. It's the DOM, the document object model that was generated from our HTML. And the folks that make browsers decided the best way to show us the DOM is to convert it back into something that looks like HTML. And that makes sense. The DOM is a tree structure, and it's built from the HTML document. It represents the HTML document. So what we're actually seeing here are DOM elements. Each of these is an object, those objects we saw being created inside the code of Google Chrome. And the developer tools have given us an easy way to look at the document object model. This can cause confusion sometimes. So let's make sure our mental model is accurate. An HTML document is downloaded by the user agent, and then it's parsed and the DOM is created. The DOM is then used to generate the actual visual representation, the web page, delivered to the user. However, when we open the developer tools, what's happening is the user agent is looking at the DOM and then converting those objects in the computer's memory into something that looks like HTML and then presenting it to us. This makes it easy for us to look at the DOM, understand what's happening, and interact with the web page at the DOM level. But the inspector is providing more than just the ability to look at the DOM. I can actually edit the DOM. If I go back up top, for example, and I double click, I can change this to Tony's resume. And when I click out, we see that the actual visual representation was updated to match the new DOM. And that's what our mental model should have. I didn't edit the HTML, I just edited the DOM. The developer tools provide that ability. And I can do more than that. For example, I could take a look at these sections and decide that this mailing address section I'd like to have further up. So I could hold on to it, drag, and drop it. And there it is, the visual representation updated again. This means it's a really fast way for me to test things, find problems, change things to see how they might look. Now here's the thing, what do you think will happen if I hit refresh in the browser? Well, it's going to make that HTTP request again, parse the HTML document, and recreate the DOM. So if I hit refresh, I get a new DOM made from the HTML document that was just requested. So editing the DOM doesn't do anything to our actual HTML document.
But this is an incredibly powerful idea, especially for us, the people working on these web pages. We can see how the browser is interpreting our HTML into the document object model. We can edit it and move it around. I could even right click and edit as HTML and just type HTML. and have it be updated. Notice that I typed HTML, and then that typed HTML was converted, was interpreted, parsed, and converted into an update to the document object model. So again, as you edit the elements, don't imagine yourself editing HTML. Imagine yourself editing these document objects in memory. And whenever you're unsure about something, you can right click, inspect, and jump to that element in the DOM to begin to understand it. We'll use this a lot more as the course goes along, especially once we get into CSS. I hope you enjoyed the first three and a half hours of my course, Understanding HTML and CSS. For the rest of the HTML content and all the CSS content, you'll find a link to the full course in the description. But whether you choose to get the full course or not, I hope you found this content useful, and I wish you the best in your web development journey. Happy authoring.